I've just bought the cheapest 718 Cayman S in the whole entire country. I was the only person at auction to bid on this thing and upon receiving delivery of it, I've kind of realized why. Let's face it, we're all guilty of it. Going onto Auto Trader, eBay, or whatever it may be, finding the car that you dream of owning and popping in lowest price first. The thing is, when you buy your Porsche, you buy it because you want one, not because you need one. I'm beginning to think, <laughs> I don't want this. Now originally it was the Porsche 718 Cayman which was in my budget and there was actually one on Auto Trader for sale. For £18,000 I could have bought a 2019 Cayman with only 13,500 miles on the clock with a small front end knock. But if you could buy the Cayman S with the 2.5 litre engine as opposed to the 2 litre engine and 350 bhp as opposed to 300 bhp for around the same sort of price, you're going to say yes right? And in this particular case, after a solid couple of seconds of thinking about it, I decided to take the risk. Now we all know when buying a car from a place like Copart, you can't actually go and see the car before you buy it. We rely solely on the photos that they take. Now I could be wrong, but beside me are the photos of this Porsche that were taken at the auction site. I don't think the damage looks too bad, right? But I can't be naive here. Every time I bought a crash damaged car from auction and then it's turned up, it's always been a lot worse than first expected. But when I was the only one bidding on this thing and the car didn't even meet its reserve price, I had a sinking feeling that I'd missed something obvious. Now the only positive I can take from this is that the Porsche was a category N, which means non-structural. I was just hoping whoever assessed this car got it right. Well actually, I'm struggling to find one decent panel on this car. The passenger side is most definitely the worst, but moving on to the driver's side, it isn't really much better. Now all of you have followed me on this crazy journey over the past three years after attempting my first ever crash damage rebuild on Hannah's Audi TT. And since then, I got the true itch of rebuilding cars. And with every one, I've tried to challenge myself more and more. But this one is most definitely going to be the most challenging one yet. Upon finding more information about this car, I think I've found the reason why nobody else bid on it. But before we get to that, let me show you all of this car's damage. So there's a lot of damage and the best way we can sort of go through this is work from the front and go backwards, starting with this driver's side front wing. I have absolutely no idea what's caused this or how it's got in this condition, but all along this side doesn't look too bad, but the damage looks towards the top. And the only thing I can suggest is maybe this car has been on its back possibly a few times. The headlight is damaged. We all know how expensive headlights are. Bumpers, that's a no-go. But what looks intact is the driver's side front wheel and the dare say all the suspension. There is a lot of mud all in here which would maybe suggest that this car's been in a ditch and possibly it was a wet day. And Hannah's going to tell you about this wheel anyway. So it's supposed to have 10 spokes but only has 9 <laughs> and it's missing a caliper. It is missing a caliper. Now the reason it is missing a brake caliper is because I actually took it off. When Mark came and delivered me the car, Copart lifted the car onto his trailer with a forklift and the only way of getting the Porsche off the trailer was to roll it off and with that 10 spoke wheel which was now 2 spoke there was a high chance it would roll round and cause damage to the caliper. And I didn't want to cause any more damage than what was already there. So with the caliper removed, I could put the two-spoke wheel back on and just about safely enough roll it off the trailer. Now, I never actually got round to showing you the full damage on the Porsche, so brace yourself. 
The driver's side wing mirror is missing along with the wiring loom as well. The driver's side door has some pretty severe dents and holes. It's completely missing a side skirt. The driver's side rear quarter has some nasty dents in it here and here. The rear bumper has damage as well as the diffuser. There's no glass in the boot and it's pretty dented up over there. The passenger side rear quarter definitely took most of the hit. There's no glass here and there's no glass here. Side skirt's damaged, door's damaged, the front passenger side wing's damaged, front bumper's damaged, the windscreen's damaged, the A pillars took a fair amount of the hit, the seat airbag's gone, the door card airbag's gone, and there's some pretty severe dents in the roof. So it's not really looking too good for the Porsche. In fact, I don't think there's any positives we can take from this. Well, actually, yes, there is. Supposedly, this thing starts, well, according to Copart, it does. Now, the engines on the Cayman are right at the back, but to access it, you can't just check underneath the boot here. I've never worked on a Porsche before, but I'm pretty sure to access the engine, you have to remove all of this panel here. But even still, after removing that panel there, I don't think you can actually access much. You can't even check the oil on these cars. It's another one of those modern cars which doesn't have a dipstick, annoyingly. But looking underneath it, I can't see any obvious signs of oil leaks or any sort of leaks coming from the back here. And to be honest, it's quite clear that most of the damage is more towards the top end of the car. But the one thing that is at the front of the car are the cooling radiators, which you can just about see here. And surprise, surprise, it looks like these have sprung a leak. But that shouldn't stop me from starting this thing. We probably can't run it to temperature because there might not be any cooling in there. But as long as there's oil in there, we should be all right. Okay, there's a fair amount of lights on the dashboard as usual. How do I scroll through this? Okay, we got low battery, refill cooling. Yes, so we are low on cooling. Check brake pads. Well, we don't have any caliper on there. Third brake light, low battery. And that should be about it. No warning for oil. So let's start this thing up. This is going to be a decider whether this car gets that little bit more expensive. Come on. First time, first time she's running. We do have an engine management light, no oil light. <laughs> I think a radiator fan is uh, catching something there. But oh, it stopped, okay, fixed itself. But yeah, something is definitely catching at the front. I'm not actually quite sure how these engines should sound. It's a four cylinder engine, 2.5 litre. It does sound a little tappity, but I don't know, maybe they're supposed to sound like that. I definitely think we can take this as a positive, the first positive. Another positive we can take as well, no dashboard airbag is gone and no steering wheel airbag is gone. Does this window work? Yes, we do have a driver's side window, um, but yeah, no passenger side window. But at least we have an engine which runs. That's definitely one positive to take out of this. So the question still lies, why was I the only bidder to bid on this Porsche Cayman S? So apart from the obvious that every single panel is damaged, this is my theory. So things like the wing, the bumper and the doors, they're all bolt on, bolt off repairs. But when we go to the rear quarter, well this is actually part of the car and it's aluminium. It's all spot welded on, all along here, along the top and down here, even where the door bolts to it. And the same goes for the roof, it's all spot welded on as flimsy as it may be now even though it's taken a massive hit to the a pillar the roof and the rear quarters of the car it's still a category n which as i previously mentioned means non-structural and i think they got it right all of these parts are aluminium they're made to be as light as possible to make the car better at handling to make the car faster and dare i say it they're not actually part of the structure i like to think of a more of a beauty cover than a structure the structure of this car is all underneath this aluminium you can see the frame just sort of bulging out from the aluminium here and i think one of the reasons why i was the only bidder on this car is if the damage has gone as far as bending that frame or denting that frame then this car is as good as scrap the chassis is bent 
And if you were to strip this all down to find out this part of the frame is all bent underneath or it's dented, then you don't really have a good parts car either. You're not really going to sell any part of this car and make any money off it. I've just noticed all the mud on the inside of this door card here and I still can't work out how that's got there. The other reason I think I was the only bidder as well is because of the parts. Now, I know you can buy rear quarters and A pillars for this Porsche. I've got the schematics and the part numbers of it here. The thing is, I don't know the price of them and whether Porsche would even sell me them in the first place. Now, remember when we first picked up the Aston Martin and we called them to find out whether we could buy the parts for it. But the main dealer wasn't actually allowed to sell structural parts to the public. You had to be an Aston Martin registered repairer. And the same story could go for this Porsche. Although I don't think these parts are structural, I don't know how they're going to take it with somebody who's not a registered repairer, more of a DIY, replacing things like the A pillar and the rear quarter. The time now is 20 to 6, so Porsche will be closer at the moment. So I guess I won't find that out until tomorrow morning. So I guess the big question is, do I have enough in this car to make it sort of sensible to repair? But before we find out exactly how much I paid for this, I wanted to get it inside and on the ramp so we could check underneath the Porsche. And I left that Okay, so before we do anything, we've checked the outside of the car, but we haven't checked what's underneath the car. And there's one thing that me and Liam can't get our heads around. So we're saying the car was rolled on this side. All the glass is smashed, the airbags have gone out on this side. Most of the damage to the rear quarter has been done on this side. But the side that doesn't have a wing mirror is that side. <laughs> this side, it has a wing mirror and there's, there's not even a scratch on it. There's literally a, not one scratch on it. How? I don't know. Okay, here we go. The most of it is just all a cover, really, and, and like, really. I'm taking a hit here, but again, it's just a cover. Take like this, part of the exhaust. Yeah. Part of the exhaust, yeah. but the exhaust looks all right. I think this is just yeah. a under tray. Oh, that was very close. I think this could be the engine sump, but this is bent up there, look, into it. So close to breaking that. So close. So close. This has definitely been, oh my God, that has definitely been put in a ditch, isn't it? And a wet one. Oh, wow. Yeah. But actually underneath, bearing in mind, actually a lot of it is all covers. It seems, oh, there's a lot of mud here as well. But it seems all right. It seems okay, to be honest. But we haven't stripped it all back yet. But so far, so good. So at least we've taken some positives from the Porsche. The underside isn't that bad. Well, it's definitely not as bad as the top side. But is this worth the repair? Have I got enough money in it to sort of make it worth repairing this thing. Well, I'll let you guys decide that because we have the black border of expense and I paid 18,500 pounds. Cayman S's around the same year and mileage are going for around 49,000 pounds. That's not a categorized one though. So have I gone completely mad with this one? Or do you think it's worth repairing? It, this is definitely going to be the biggest rebuild that we've ever attempted so far. But if we pull it off, this is going to be one sick car. So here it is, the cheapest Porsche 718 Cayman S in the whole entire country. And this is what it sounds like. <laughs> it's not the most healthiest of sounding things. And it's also not the most healthiest of looking things in the UK either. 
Now in the last video I explained to you guys that I bought this Porsche from auction and I was the only bidder. This car didn't even meet its reserve price. But at the cost of £18,500, I still don't think it's too bad of a deal. I think it looks a lot worse than it actually is. Well, I hope it looks a lot worse than it actually is. Now, I think the part that puzzled us the most with this is we couldn't work out how every single panel on this car has been damaged. But I think I found part of the reason and it's not actually from the accident. Now we sort of figured out that there was some sort of impact on this passenger side for the door card airbag to blow and also the seat airbag to blow on that side. But alongside that, we have a window smashed on this side, a window smashed there. We have roof damage, we've got rear quarter damage, we've got boot damage. We even have rear bumper damage as well along the bottom here. I also had an obliterated windscreen which has been removed no driver's side wing mirror, a severely damaged driver's side wing and headlight, the passenger side front wheel is battered, the passenger side A pillar is battered, the driver's side rear quarter is gone, and there's no driver's side side skirt. But check out this door. I can't believe I didn't notice this before. Now, other than this mark and this pretty severe hole and dent, this door would have been actually okay and it was quite hard to work out what actually caused that and if you look at it from here this line is pretty evenly spaced along with this line here which is the same space as that line there and then it looks like it's been dragged all the way down and it's the same for the side skirt the two lines there and the two lines there and that side skirt would have been completely fine if it wasn't for these two lines some of you have probably already guessed where that damage has came from but bear with me now the back bumper would have been completely fine but yes you guessed it if it was and four, the two lines running down here, this broken part there, and again, the two lines running down there with the broken part there. There's one more. Here is the driver's side door, which again, would have been completely fine if it wasn't for the same type of lines, which have pierced a hole and rubbed all the way down the door there, and down here as well. All of these damages are way too uniform to be caused by the crash. So what did cause them? Now this Porsche was bought from Copart and any guesses what they use to move around salvaged cars at Copart? You guessed it, a forklift. But hey, either way, it doesn't change the fact that I still bought this car and I still have to repair it. And it's not like there was hiding anything. All of the damage were shown on the pictures at the auction. But I'm just a little miffed that the car could have been in a little bit better condition if there was some careful forklift driving. Now I say I've got to repair this Porsche, I am still on the edge and at the moment all I've paid for is the car. My goal right now is to strip the car apart and work out what parts are salvageable and what parts need replacing. Just like this wheel. The first thing that was coming to my attention was the noise that comes from just in front of the driver's side wheel when the car's on. It sounds like a fan is almost catching on the arch lining. And then I since found out it wasn't catching on the arch lining, but it was catching on a lot of mud and stones. It seems the Porsche has definitely crashed into some kind of muddy ditch or field to Hannah's disliking. But other than that, inside the driver's wheel well, everything seems to be in pretty good order. Although it is difficult to tell whether any of the suspension is damaged until it's been on a wheel alignment. Next off is the front bumper. I know that this isn't salvageable, but I'm hoping that there's no damage behind it. And my hopes were soon shattered because, well, there was a lower crash bar which was completely bent. I'm moving swiftly on to the driver's side front wing and headlight. Both of these are completely battered and definitely need replacing. Again, more hopes that there's no damage behind this wing. But this time all seems well. So that's the front end completely apart and there's only sort of one real hidden surprise, which I didn't expect, is the front lower crash bar here, which is all bent up, but it's not too much of a drama because I did find one on eBay for £150 plus £7.50 postage. So it's not 
too bad at the minute. So, so far it's not really cost us anything because I'm still on edge on whether this thing's actually worth repairing or not. And there's a few things that's gonna decide that. So here's the driver's side wing, which is good to no one. It's also the headlight bracket. And then the headlight as well. That's completely obliterated. And again, that's gonna be good to absolutely no one. And we all know how expensive headlights can be. The passenger side wing probably could be salvageable. It's not too bad. But then we have the passenger side headlight as well. Looks in okay condition. It all works. There is a few scratches on top. I don't know whether we'll maybe be able to get them out. I don't think it's worth replacing the passenger side headlight just for those scratches. But for a driver side headlight, we're looking around £900. And that's second hand. We knew it was going to be expensive but I don't think that was it's not too bad but I'm not going to be pulling the trigger on any of those parts just yet there's two things I want to be 100% sure about before I do the rear quarter is replaceable we know that and it's not actually classed as structure for the car it's just basically like a beauty panel almost it's covering over the structure of it and in my opinion the rear quarter doesn't look so bad it doesn't look like it's pushed anything underneath any of the inner rear quarter or anything like that but running along all down here and underneath the a pillar is the structure of the car and you can just see the structure there and if that structure which is underneath this a pillar is bent twisted or sort of pushed in in any way well the car's probably not worth repairing and the only way for me to find out whether that is damaged is to remove the a pillar skin now this is one huge panel and you can see here all the spot welds which are holding it to the actual frame of the car but I'm not going to be spending my time drilling all of those out just to find out it's damaged. So for now, I'm getting the angle grinder out to cut a little window in the A-pillar so I can see if there's any damage behind it, which fingers crossed there isn't. And the first incision was made it's looking like good news. So as expected, underneath the actual A pillar, it looks as if the actual chassis of the car is all in one piece and there's no bends in there. There is a tiny, tiny little dent there, but I cannot see that little dent putting out the whole chassis of the car. It is the tiniest little surface dent, but I could see why maybe an insurance company would probably category S it because of that. But it's been category end, which is non-structural. So, so far, so good. So for once, we can actually take a positive from the Porsche. But there's still more. So another thing I wanted to be 100% confident about before throwing a lot of money and a lot of time at this Porsche is the engine. I want to make sure that this engine runs to temperature and is all good. Because if it's no good, then that just adds to further cost, further repair and further labour, which... Again, we are working on fine margins with this car. Now we know that the Porsche starts and runs at the moment. It does sound a little bit tappity, but a few of you guys mentioned in the last video, that's just how these 2.5 liters sound. The thing is we haven't run the car to temperature and the only reason we haven't is because it doesn't hold coolant and it doesn't hold coolant because this radiator right at the front here is just smashed to bits. So all the coolant just leaks out of here. On this side, you've got an aircon condenser. Behind that, you've got the actual coolant radiator. And then behind that, you've got the coolant fan and it seems a similar story on the driver's side but if we can get the Porsche to hold coolant then we can run it to temperature then we can find out whether this engine is all good to go but this is where the expense starts inside this box here is a brand new second-hand radiator pack including the aircon condenser the radiator and the fan believe me I looked everywhere for the best price but this ended up costing me 1200 Pounds. Painful. So a big low blow from the Porsche there, but that's not going to stop me from continuing. It seems again we're rebuilding a car which shares a few badges with other brands. Maybe this will come in help in the future. But right now we've got the old radiator and fan off the car and it's time to put on the new one. The £1,200 one. All of this was pretty easy to install because it's really accessible with that front wing and the arch lining out.
I just had to remove that lower bent crash bar to put that intake duct on. Okay, radiator, aircon pipes, and fan all on. It's not the most stable thing at the minute, and that's because the top bracket, which sits, well, at the top, the spot welds, as you can see there, have pulled out from the actual frame of the car. But when Mark comes and helps me weld on the side of the quarter, when we get to that point, we should be able to re-weld this back on and it should be nice and sturdy. So now really it's the moment of truth. I've got some uh, coolant here to pop in there. Then we can run the car up to temperature. I have no idea where the expansion tank is on this car. Obviously the engine being mid-engine or in the back. I don't know whether it's going to be under this carpet. A quick Google will probably solve that. And with the coolant as well, I've also got some uh, oil and oil filter because this car, like loads of new cars, doesn't have a dipstick. So there's no way of me really checking the oil. And I don't really want to run the car up to temperature with low oil. I assume a light would come on the dashboard if you did have low oil. But the only way of checking it is running it up to temperature, then it will give you a oil level. So I might as well just change the oil, then I know the right amount of oil is in the car. So let's figure out <laughs> how to get to all of that. Yep. Ah. And oil. Ah. Can I just say, I found that. Matt's gonna take you <laughs> <laughs> So after Chris found where to top up the coolant and where to top up the oil, I began topping up the coolant. Yes, without a funnel, but I've got skills. But it turns out later on, I was wrong to do this. But before we get onto that, we pop the car in the air, ready to drain the oil from the Porsche. And even this became a challenge. Okay, there's a slight issue. On this ramp here, um, the actual sump is underneath that under tray there, and I can't remove that because this ramp is just awkward as anything. And, well, the way the car is at the moment, I still have to start it to get it into the big ramp. So we might as well start this and run it up to temperature with the old oil in. It's not ideal, but I feel like if it does have low oil, there'll be a low oil light on the dashboard. We're putting trust in that. So with the trust in the electronics of the car, I started the Porsche and began to run it up to temperature, hoping that it'd all be good. The fan has got clearance now. Get in. We're hoping we'll be okay. I'm not sure why the fan comes on straight away. That one's on as well. Nice and cool, eh? See the bubbles coming out, so I feel like it is self-leading. Yeah. Bubbling. I went to grab the diagnostic tool because I wanted to plug it in to see if we had any engine faults with the car. Because there was a few lights on the dash. A few warning lights. We've got engine management light. Um, restraint system light, well airbag light, and that is probably because, oh that seatbelt's locked out. We need a seatbelt. That airbag's gone and that airbag's gone. And I didn't realize about that seatbelt. But, oh that seatbelt's locked out as well. I then found sport mode. Whoa. But before I got a chance to read the codes on the car, the coolant temperature started to rise. It seems the coolant started to run through the system, so it needed topping up. And as the car started to run to temperature, the fans started to pick up their speed. And remember the stones that we cleared out at the start? Well, it seems I didn't clear them all out. Whoa! 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 And the fan started going ballistic, throwing stones all around the unit. In there. I don't know, <laughs> oh my god, that is not good. That is a danger fan. What? <laughs> oh my god, is that oh, all this? Oh, that's just come out of it. And oh, it's bit oh, oh. oh no. Oh no. Oh, it's oh, flinger stoned it's, into yeah, it, isn't it? <laughs> wow. So that's blue radiator. Nice. Lesson learned. Make sure your radiators are clear of any debris before they go on because that has pile drive the radiator. It turns out these Porsches like to airlock in the coolant system and you're supposed to vacuum fill the coolant. And if you don't, the car will think it is overheating because of the airlock and spin the fans into warp speed. And if you've got stones going in your fan, well, that's a whole different problem. Well, 
I really hope that this car isn't going to be one of them that is three steps forward and then another four steps backwards because that's exactly what we've just done. This radiator wasn't even damaged but now it is and that seems like it's around a well a 600 pound mistake. But with projects like this I've got to expect the unexpected. <laughs> Since winning the Cayman S at the auction, we've worked out that every single panel has got damage to it, to the point where most of them are no good to anyone. And we worked out in the last video that some of the damage wasn't even caused by the crash. It was actually caused by a forklift picking the car up at the auction place, like these holes here and here. And another thing that's literally just came to mind, bearing in mind how bad this accident was, whoever was driving the Porsche at the time of the accident was definitely not wearing a seatbelt because this seatbelt is locked in this position, which normally happens when the airbags blow which they have on this side so I dread to think the injuries that they would have had now despite the damage on the Porsche and the little hiccup we had in the last video with the radiator we've still only spent 19,700 pounds and that's including the car but of course we are going to need to replace that front radiator so I've already learned that parts aren't cheap for this Porsche so I've got to be extra careful when working on this thing to make sure we don't make any more mistakes like the last one wow so that's blue radiator but regardless of that i am determined to fix this and get it back on the road so we've got a lot to do today i've decided and i'm sure you guys will agree that most of this side of the car is not salvageable and all needs to come off including the rear quarter and the a pillar i've never in my life removed an a pillar or a rear quarter so this one is definitely going to be interesting Now before I even start thinking about the A-pillar and the rear quarter, there is so many more damaged parts on the Porsche that need to be removed. One of them including this door. But along with the damaged parts, there are some parts that are salvageable. So I'm going to be taking off the good parts before throwing away the bad parts. All the trims and the wiring looms inside the door are going to be easily transferred onto a new door. And although the glass is smashed, the window regulator still looks in okay condition. And surprisingly, the wing mirror doesn't have any damage either. So that was just one bolt to remove it. And then we can slide all the wiring loom out with it. To remove the door, there's one bolt holding the check strap to the chassis of the car. We can then slide out all the wiring loom for the door. And then there's two grub screws clamping the hinges to the frame of the car. And then we should just be able to lift this door off, giving us much better access to that A pillar. So, do you know when we title these videos, Rebuilding? This is a genuine rebuild, this car. There's not really much on it that doesn't need replacing. Even this door card, any, like this, is all broken at the bottom. I don't know how that's happened. There's loads of mud on the door card, which I don't know how that's happened inside the car. Where the airbag is blown from the inside here, I think it's ripped the top of the door card. And you know what, I'm actually surprised. I think a Porsche is meant to be kind of like a premium car. This kind of feels a bit Volkswagen Polo-y type of door card. But this is going to need replacing. Luckily, I think all these trims here, the burgundy red, which is not my favourite of colours, I think they are transferable onto another door card though. So we don't have to find the exact same colour door card. So yeah, that's no good. Moving on to this part. The seats. Now, along with the door card airbag blowing, the seat airbag has also gone on the passenger side. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the burgundy red centers on the seats, so I may look to see if I could upgrade or just replace them completely. But for the meantime, I'm going to get the seat out. That way, I can dismantle the seat to check the part number on the airbag and weigh up what's going to be the best decision with them. So there's a lot of mess in here. Some of this including cyclosine hydrochloride tablet, tablets, which I've Googled, it's a anti-sickness um, pill. Three of them have been taken. Hopefully that was before the crash. <laughs> so a quick clean up was definitely needed before I carried on. Next up, removing the seat belts. Both of these are completely locked out. With the Aston Martin, we sent the seat belts off to have the tensioners replaced and reset. And now imagine the way that these prices are going with the Porsche parts, that will probably end up doing the same thing with this car. 
Once I've got that seatbelt out, I've got to remove the rear glass. Well, what's left of the rear glass from the quarter? There's a bolt at the bottom, a bolt at the top, and then the rest is just all on clips. And then moving quickly on to the side skirt. This doesn't look so bad, but there is two pierce holes where we think the forklift has gone straight into it. And once the side skirt is off, it's time for the boot. This is truly a removal marathon. Not only is the glass smashed in the boot, but it's also pretty badly dented. With the boot removed, it's time for the rear bumper to come off. To get the rear bumper off, I've got to remove the rear lights. These were held in by one 10mm bolt, and then I had to sort of knock the bolt through to push the rear lights away from the car. Then I could access two more bolts which held the bumper on. I then quickly realised I had to remove the spoiler to be able to pull the bumper away from the car. And that's pretty much one stripped apart Cayman S. One thing's for sure, I have never stripped apart a car to this extent ever, never mind a Porsche. But the more I strip it apart, the less damage it's beginning to look. Well, in my eyes it is. And it's slowly starting to reveal those little spot wells that we need to access. So check this out, I've already ordered a rear quarter from Porsche, an A pillar from Porsche, and a roof from Porsche. Some manufacturers can be funny about ordering structural parts directly from them if you're not a registered repair center, but Porsche, they were completely fine about me ordering anything, and the price weren't actually too bad. But we'll get onto pricing when they finally arrive. For now, let me show you what we need to take off. Now, when the Porsche is built from the factory, this rear quarter, which runs all the way along down here, up here, along the A pillar, all the way down here and joins to this part there, that is all one huge piece. But if you want to buy that full piece, it's not possible. They're actually sold individually. I can't quite remember the reason why, but they do start off around here and they end around there. And then when you buy the A pillar, it starts off there and then it ends in that same spot there and you have to join it up. The rear quarter and the A pillar should actually arrive tomorrow so we can see exactly where we need to join it. But before we can fit the new quarter and the new A pillar, we need to get the old one off which means we have to drill out all of these individual spot welds there and separate it from the skin on the inside. So this is just an outer skin to it. And I'm pretty sure as well with the roof, again, this runs along the back here, which I've just found out. These are all spot welded on all around there. So we need to drill them off. And there may be some underneath. So the roof lining has got to come out so we can access all of that. So we're still not there. Let's carry on. Off we come with the roof lining. Now a common question that I get asked is how do I know how to do all of this? And the simple answer is I don't. I learn as I go along. I think some people think you need to be a mechanic to be able to work on cars. That was way easier than I expected. I mean taking apart an Aston Martin roof lining I imagine that would have taken me hours. This was a couple of minutes. I had a Volkswagen Lupo back in the day and all of this stuff feels kind of like Lupo-y, Polo-y type and everything's on clips, it honestly it doesn't, it wasn't what I expected. And I've done all that and I'm not sure I actually needed to, like all of this is the inner skin and you can see all the spot welds here which is the inner skin, we want to obviously take off the roof and like I don't, unless the top bit's there, I don't know how you're going to drill that out though, I'm not so sure about this now, how I'm going to get this roof off. Unless the roof is only held on with the spot welds along the front and the spot welds along the back, but that just doesn't seem right to me. There's only really one way to find out. I can start taking off this rear quarter and the A pillar and see if it sort of exposes anything to do with the roof. So here we go, a lot of spot welds to drill out to get this rear quarter off. I bought some special spot weld drill bits, which came in a special box as well. And I was excited to use them. These drill bits are designed just to drill through the first layer of the spot weld and not to go any further than that. That way it keeps welding to a minimal when we put the new rear quarter on the car. But after about 10 minutes of using my special spot weld drill bits, I realised they were crap. And I just resorted in using the grinder with a sanding disc on. This sanded down the spot weld super thin so they became nice and brittle so I could chisel them off easily. My lover. 
Little did I know what I was getting myself into when I started this. But it's one of those jobs which I've started now and I've got to finish. But after hours of hammering and chiseling, I finally managed to pull the rear quarter away from the car. How cool is this? So the rear quarter is off now. Well, part of the rear quarter is off. And how cool is this? You can see all the separate little parts which come together to build this Porsche. And the good news is this actual inner structure here, there's no damage on it. There's no dents on it. And that'll be partly why this wasn't a category S car, a category end car a non-structural one because this rear quarter here is so light it literally is just a cover for all the structural parts so you can see here this is what i've ordered from porsche the rear quarter and the a pillar there but i haven't cut it all off just yet and i still can't work out how to get the roof off but there was only one way to find out and that was to attack it with the angle grinder I just cut out a small section just to see if I could see any joins from the roof to the rear quarter. And it looks as if the roof was just bonded to the rear quarter, not actually welded to it. the job and I'll see you in hell. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Cayman S Convertible. The Cayman S Convertible. The new 718 Cayman S with the super safe removable hardtop. Super safe! <laughs> Want to show off your impressive hairline? You now can with the full window delete. It also includes sharp aerodynamic bodywork and the stylish one-seater interior. Order now for the limited edition two-spoke wheels. Terms and conditions apply. All work is carried out by unprofessionals. Please do not try this at home. So the roof is now off the Cayman S and there was nothing connected it from the front to the back. It was all just bonded to the side of the quarter panel and you can't actually take the quarter panel off without taking the roof off. Roof off, check this out. All these spot welds here you can see are actually underneath the roof. So I'm still gonna have to do some more sort of drilling out to get the uh, quarter off there properly, but at least we managed to get the roof off and kind of the quarter panel. And just like that, near enough, a whole half of a Porsche has been delivered. Now, one thing I've noticed from jumping across from the Aston Martin to the Porsche is that Porsche parts are a lot easier to get hold of. And we have to actually say a massive thanks to Silverson Porsche and Design 911 for this. Although the parts definitely weren't free. So we'll get onto the prices of everything later on, but we've actually got a lot more than they originally thought, which means, well, it's good in some ways and bad in others. Good in some ways that we're gonna be able to make it look nice and fresh and new on the rear quarter, but bad in ways that I've got to do a lot more chiseling. So for future reference, if any of you guys order a rear quarter from Porsche, this is what you're gonna get. And this is what I've taken off. And you may notice there's quite a lot more on that than what I've taken off this. So the first thing I noticed, we actually have the rear lighthouse in with this rear quarter. And I actually left all of this on the car, which is not a problem. I can still get that off and put that one on, or I can choose to take it off that one and put it on this one. And not only that, it came with loads more parts. I did cut mine here because I wasn't sure how far down the rear quarter was gonna go, but it turns out it goes all the way down to where it joins up nicely there and you've got a bit of seam sealer running over the top of it so whether we replace this whole thing and put that on i've still got to decide what is best and what's going to be the easiest and what's going to line up and sort of be hidden as well you don't want anyone to see that it's had a full new quarter apart from every single person who's watched this video would know that then we have the a pillar and together we pretty much have an entire car if you can see here there is a joining mark 
just there and the guy I saw on Paul said I think there's about a centimeter or so overrun which you can cut down and make it fit perfectly. It's gonna be a bit of a challenge, but luckily we have Mark who's coming down to help me do all the welding and he should be able to master that. So then that leaves us with all of these parts here and I didn't go half-hearted with this build. Now, you guys have been watching me long enough now to know when there's a chance to replace something, there's always a chance to upgrade it. And that's exactly the case here. Check out all of this carbon. Now I get way too ahead of myself, I get excited, I see something I like and I just buy it and that's exactly what I've done here. What you see here is a 718 GT4 body kit and it looks absolutely mental. All of this is carbon fiber front splitter, carbon fiber rear diffuser, we've got this sort of swan neck spoiler as well which is absolutely massive, I can't wait to see that on, and a GT4 front bumper. This is a genuine GT4 front bumper, one of them would have cost a fortune so we saved quite a bit buying a sort of replica one. It's really sort of flexible as well so it should Fingers, cro fingers crossed, fit nice. And it doesn't just stop there. There's still a lot more in these boxes, which should be a full complete puzzle to rebuild this port. Knowing I was gonna get all this carbon and knowing that I was gonna chop off the old roof, I thought it was a perfect opportunity to upgrade the roof to a carbon one. But the guys at Porsche mentioned the GT4 doesn't come with a carbon roof, but the new GT4 RS does come with a carbon roof. The problem is for a carbon roof for the GT4 RS, it's around 30,000 pounds. So I give that one a pass. And you can see why here, because the standard roof cost me 487 pounds. And whilst we're on the expense board, the A pillar cost me 870 pounds. Exactly. And then moving on to the rear quarter. 1,108 pounds and 33 pence bringing the total cost of the car and all the parts so far to £22,165.33. We'll get onto the cost of the GC4 kit in a later video, but it's not as bad as you actually think. But for now, it seems I've got my work cut out, quite literally. This was a rear quarter. And this was a roof. All of which is came off the 718 Cayman S, which quite rightly was the cheapest one in the UK. Now I've got to say thank you to Wheelmania already because they sorted us out with a pair of sort of temporary wheels just so we can actually move this Porsche around the unit and get it on and off the ramp. You all saw the state of the old wheels. On the driver's side, they're not so bad, but the passenger side, they were completely battered. But at least now we can move the Porsche on and off the ramp and around the unit. And before we start rebuilding the Porsche today, there's still parts that we need to take off. We've got the driver's seat that needs to come out and the driver's side seat belt. Both seat belts have locked out and this usually happens when an airbag blows in the car. So I'll be sending the seat belts off to get reset, put new tensioners on and then they can go back in the car. But what I'm doing now is removing all the carpets and the trims from the back of the car because we're gonna be doing a lot of welding and we don't want any fires. And now she looks just about ready for a roof, a rear quarter, and the A-pillar. All of which we already have. The new roof is here. That costs 487 pounds. The new A-pillar is here. That costs 870 pounds. And we have a full new rear quarter here, which costs 1,108 pounds and 33p. The only one thing that we're missing now is a mark who's gonna be welding it to the car. And what he's doing right now is punching all the holes in the uh, quarter panel here, which is gonna allow for the spot welding to commence on the Porsche. This is what we need. I need a bit of guidance because I could mess this up. Well, Mark, Mark's not gonna mess it up, is he? So he's, he's hiding from the camera. <laughs> So I'm sure Mark's feeling as enthusiastic about this job as I am. First step is to get the rear quarter in place and hold it there with some mole grips. Now to make sure this is perfectly lined up, we need a door to line it against. 
And here's my brand new second hand door, which is a slightly different shade of silver. <laughs> and then to line the door up, we need to put the wing on. So it's back on with the old wing to make sure everything all lines up. And it didn't. So we'd figured we'd use the old door as a reference point, as we know the hinges were adjusted to that car before. And that seemed to do the trick. And then out comes the MIG welder. All of these panels are steel, so it's pretty easy to spot weld them all in. Well, when I say pretty easy, Mark was tackling it. Working his way all the way across the quarter panel, and of course, all these spot welds will be filed down and flush at the end. And whilst he was doing that, I was tackling another job. So I've spoken to um, the approved body shop. That's absolutely fine. They're quite happy to talk, um, talk it through with you. Oh, wicked. Um, that's no problem. So if I give you their contact number. Yep. We had a problem. We know how the rear quarter and the A pillar goes on with the spot welds. The problem we had was the roof. We know it's spot welded at the front and the back of it, but along the side, we wasn't too sure. So I was calling Porsche for a bit of insight. Hello, uh, it's Matt Armstrong calling. I'm just putting a roof on a Porsche and we're just trying to work out um, how it's joined between the roof and the quarter panel when he said you should be able to guide us through that. And after speaking to the approved Porsche body shop, they told us that if it's a structural bond, they're not allowed to tell us. Um, they have had a quick look and as they um, had suspected, it is a structural repair, so unfortunately they wouldn't be able to give you any information on it. Oh, bugger. Right, okay. We've got some super glue anyway, we should, we should be alright with that. <laughs> so we had a problem that we needed to solve. But before we got onto that problem, we needed to carry on doing the rear quarter. And it's about time I learnt to weld. And I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but... That was perfect. That's disgusting. No, it just looks like a That's nipple. A big bubble. <laughs> That's how it's meant to look. <laughs> That's a nipple. Hannah's a hard woman to please, but regardless of that, I'm moving over to the A pillar now, and you can see we've already made a cut here. We're gonna be joining it at the front here rather than replacing the whole thing, because that way it's gonna be much easier to align everything. We also need to make sure that the join at the back is spot on as well. From the factory, the A pillar and the quarter panel is all one piece. But when you're buying from Porsche, they come in two pieces, I assume just for storage reasons. That means we've got to join it up. So we've cut out a little bit of metal just to weld on underneath. That way it works as a sleeve so the A pillar's got something to weld onto. But this is where the precision comes in. This has got to be absolutely spot on for everything to all line up. So we're making sure we take our time here. And now you can see where it's supposed to join at the back. The body line has got to be perfect. Not only at the back, but also at the front. And before we start the weld of no return, I started sanding down the other spot welds to make it look nice and neat. And whilst I was doing that, it gave me time to think about how we was going to fix the roof to the quarter. So here it is, the welds of no return. After the welds are done, we sand them all down and make it look nice and smooth, just like none of the work was ever done. Then Mark started sanding away the spot welds he'd done on the rear quarter, whilst I started prepping the roof on the other side, ready for it to go into place. Okay, now it's time for the roof. The rear quarter and the A pillar are on, I'll show you that in a minute, but this is the big part, the roof. The bit that Porsche wouldn't tell us how it's fitted because it's technically a structural part. And after doing a bit of research, we've sort of, kind of, we think, figured it out. When they build the Porsches from factory, they bond the roof on and then they use spot welds. We know this because I drilled out all of the spot welds and knocked it off and then you've got the bonding marks where all the bond was from the front at the back and the sides and everything like that. So we know they bond it on. The problem is, is the little seam that runs from the back to the front or the front to the back. That's what we couldn't work out. And it's almost like a brass type of weld, which turns out it's like a laser weld and it's a machine that does that. 
Now, when the Porsche Body Shop replaces a roof, they're not gonna use that same laser welder. It's a machine that does that, at least we don't think. We can use the same bond they use and we can spot weld it at the front and at the back. So what we're gonna do is run the bonds and then I think on top of that, there's gonna be a Sikaflex bead along the top of it which can be painted and that's the way we're gonna roll with this. Maybe a lot of you are gonna be screaming in the comments that we got this wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how they're gonna replace it. I cannot see any other way of doing that. Let's do this. On we go with the roof. And this is what we're gonna be using. This is the same bond they used to bond windscreens on with. So it's pretty hardcore. It requires a primer to go down first and then on with the bond. There was also two more lines of bond, which was a separate type of bond, which sat on the structural parts of the car. So I started attacking those bits. And now we are ready for the roof. Me and Mark rested it into place. And once we was happy with the location, we can begin the spot weld. And just to confirm everything lines up, we're on with the new door, adjusted the hinges, and then came on with the new boot lid. We did it. Oh, wait, I need to do that man thing. That's never coming off. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, it's actually starting to look like a Porsche again. I'm not even touching the surface of where this needs to be, but it's definitely one step in the right direction and what a hell of a step that was. I'll talk about the cost of the door and the boot in a minute, but let me talk you through the roof. So the roof is spot welded like it was from the factory along the top here. Now I've sanded all this down so it's nice and smooth. You can't really tell that's all gonna be painted and of course a windscreen will sit on there. Then on the back, it is also spot welded at the back down here. You can't really see, quite difficult, but that's how it was from factory, from standard. That's what I had to chisel off in the previous video. So that's how it was from standard. And then inside the car here, you can see all the bonding here, well, the ceiling, and that is holding that roof. I know it's cliche to say it, but it is, that is not going anywhere. And you may or you may not have seen, there was a sticker on the old roof, which is around here, and that's sort of like a sound deadening sticker, and it stops, stops this sort of tin canny sound. So I definitely need to get one of them stuck on there, but that's the least of my worries at the minute. But then we have this issue. You can see here, there is still a gap between the A pillar, the rear quarter, and the roof along there. If we were to leave that like that, water would build up in there. It would probably whistle in the wind. It just wouldn't be great. But if I was to use body filler along this gap here and try to make it all look smooth, more than likely it would crack after time because all these panels do have a little bit of twist and movement in them when you're driving along. So I'm gonna be using a product called Sikaflex, which is flexible, it's paintable, and it should give it that nice OEM finish along this little gap here. So there's the roof, the quarters, and the A pillar on. And of course, how can we forget we've got the brand new second hand door on and the boot lid. The door cost me 400 pounds. And the boot lid, that cost me 300 pounds. But wait, when we opened this boot lid, we realized that there was damage on it. There was damage to this quarter right here. So we had to knock it out a tiny bit I notified the guy that I bought it off and he did give me a refund, but not a full refund. He knocked a little bit off, leaving the price at 200 pounds. Leaving the total cost of the build, including the car so far at 22,765 pound and 33 P. And of course we've got to do a shout out to Mark at Car and Commercial for coming out and helping me with the welding. And we've been ignoring the fact that we still haven't run this car up to temperature. We replaced the radiator on the front left and the front right one was okay until a stone went straight through it and pierced a hole in it, stopping us from running this car to temperature. But we have a solution. 
a new radiator. This time it is brand new from Porsche because it was actually the cheapest to get it from there. I did look at recalling the radiator and getting it repaired, but a brand new one did seem like the better option. To remove this, it's going to be pretty easy because we got most of the parts off already. We just got to disconnect the aircon condenser from the radiator and the radiator from the fan. Once we've done that, I can lift in the new radiator. Pop in the plastic shroud in. Then the aircon condenser, connect the aircon pipes up, and then all the coolant pipes to the new radiator. And there we go, one fresh radiator on the Porsche. Next up, fill it with coolant. Now the reason the fan went into warp speed last time is because I believe there was an airlock and that's because we filled the coolant up the incorrect way. This time we're going to do it right. We've got to vacuum fill it. These Porsches are prone to airlocks in the system because the radiators are right at the front of the car and then the expansion tank is right at the back. So this vacuum filler plugs into the expansion tank and then the compressor blows air across it. You then open a tap up, which creates a vacuum in the full cooling system. When you're happy with the vacuum, you turn the tap off, disconnect the airline, and before you go and grab your coolant, you want to wait and make sure that it holds the vacuum. That way you can ensure the cooling system has no leaks. Then you can go and grab your coolant. You then connect the pipe up to the vacuum filler system. And because the cooling system's got a vacuum in it, it will then just suck the coolant from the coolant bottle until the system is completely full. There will be a little bit you need to top up, but you can do that after you remove the vacuum system. And hopefully, that should do it. And oh yeah, the new radiator, it cost me £300. Not so bad. Okay, now we should have a fully bled system, two radiators which work, and hopefully, a half decent engine which runs to temperature fingers crossed otherwise we've done all that and it, i'm not even going to say it let's get this thing started i'm feeling confident this time not that i wasn't feeling confident last time here we go i'm just going straight for it no hesitation come on So we've got oil temp, oil pressure, uh, coolant temp and boost. Let's keep an eye on them. Hopefully we can run this car to temperature and nothing goes wrong, please. Looking okay down there at the minute. I can still see some coolant. Yeah. Oh, we've got a fan on. Yes. We've got, oh no. Is that one on? Yeah. I'm going to sit in the car just in case it starts blowing stuff. We've got a fan on. I suck it. Okay, two fans, two fans are on, which is good news. The engine's sounding a lot better after it's ran up. It did sound a bit tippity before. And it's 90 degrees then. We might have bled it properly. It stayed 90 degrees. All your temps at 72, that's warmed up. Come on! That fan on, that fan's on. Oh my God, we've got a working car. Yes! Now that is what we call progress. One, <laughs> I was gonna say nearly complete. <laughs> We're far from it. But one Porsche, which is a lot better than it was at the start of the video. Let's get this thing started up and outside and then we can go through the next lot of repairs to get this thing back on the road. Most of you would know by now that I was mad enough to buy the cheapest 718 Cayman S in the whole entire country. It costed me £18,500. In the last video, I fitted a rear quarter, an A pillar and a roof. And I'm over the moon because now she drives! <laughs> But I think that might be the least of my worries because we've still got a lot more to do. And although we got a lot of work done in the last video, I was a little lazy and I missed out a few vital parts that I need to make sure I do today. 
But who can blame me? I am no mechanic and I don't claim to be, but that's why this repair has been one of the hardest I've ever had to do. If I want my repair to last, then we've got to do all the little things like this. Here you can see where the new rear quarter meets the sill, and on all the OEM parts, there's like a bit of sealer, which runs around where each panel meets a new panel, if that makes sense. This is to stop any water or anything else getting in between the gaps of the panels, then causing it to corrode or rust away. So now it's up to me to try and get this as neat as possible. <laughs> Off to a bit of a bad start, but I'm sure we can redeem it. There was a lot of other things that we did to prevent rust, like using weld through primer before welding the new panels to the car. And probably one of the most vital places where it gets the most dirt and wet is under the wheel arch. So I'm going to make sure I pay special attention to that area. Well, Matt, you've successfully made that look rubbish. How rude of you. <laughs> Actually, you're kind of right. It does look a bit of a mess at the minute, but... I'm sure when this is all painted up, it won't look too bad. All of this sealant is going to be covered up by a side skirt, and regardless of whether it looks rubbish or not, it's doing its job. And the part that you are probably going to see is this part here, and I don't think it looks too far off the OEM side. But now I really am in a predicament because I want to put this car back together, but the more I put it back together, the more work the body shop's going to have to do stripping it apart again to paint it all. The body shop are going to be doing things like neating up the join there, neating up the join here, doing the bead of Sikaflex down the roof and making it look nice and OEM, sorting out all the dents on the driver's side like here, here and up here as well. And last but not least, they're going to be painting it and this car's going to be painted a completely different colour. So they need everything really as stripped apart as possible and that's the exact opposite to what i'm going to be doing so i'm sorry body shop but the reason i'm doing this is because i'm still unsure whether i've got all the parts for this car and also i'm going to be fitting a lot of aftermarket parts so it's nice to test whether they fit first before they go into paint and we have to readjust them afterwards and if there are parts missing the perfect time for me to order them will be when the car is at the body shop that way when it comes out, I'll have the parts ready to fit. At least that's my train of thought. Now we are going to be reusing the rear bumper. Only problem with this, there's some pretty severe holes in it from what we think was a forklift. I don't really know anything about bodywork as you're about to find out, but I'm more than happy to give things a go. So I'm going to heat the bumper up, then use some plastic weld on the back of it to hold it together. And after the plastic welds on, just to give it a bit more strength for the back, I'm going to add some fiberglass. And once the fiberglass is dry, I'm going to be using a special filler which is made for plastic bumpers over the top. And whilst we wait for the filler to set, I can move back onto the car and start installing a load of trims and plastic pieces. Next thing to go on is the front wing. Again, I'm not going to be replacing this because there's only a few small dents in it, which I think the body shop should be able to sort out before paint. And with the front wing on, I can put on the new side skirt and we'll get to all the prices later in the video. But now it's starting to look like more of a car. With this special bumper filler dry, I can then start sanding it down to try and get it nice and smooth. And once I've done that, I can then start to add normal body filler because I feel this was a lot easier to shape and get right before paint. And whilst I wait for that to dry, I can start to add more plastic pieces which hold the rear bumper in place. And then I'm back at it with the sandpaper on the rear bumper. And finally, a bit of primer to find the high and low spots of the filler. Well, it's definitely not as easy as it looks, but it's definitely better than what it was. This side, we have no hole on there now. It's primed up. The body shop could definitely touch it up and make it look a lot better than what I have. This side was the worst side and the thing you may notice is that it was really hard to keep the body line consistent throughout the whole of the rear bumper and it does go off a bit there. When the diffuser's on, maybe it'll distract a bit from it, but it definitely needs touching up from the body shop. At least I gave it a go myself and I've learned quite a lot. Now this rear bumper's about to go on, the Porsche is slowly going to start to come together. But I'd be lying if I said that this was an easy rebuild. Look 
at that. We are well and truly moving in the right direction now. In fact, it's putting the other side to shame. So next up is the spoiler, a window, a door handle, hey, and a wing mirror. And that is pretty much it for one side and it's looking so much better. There are little trims and seals missing around the door, but we do have them. I'm not going to put them on just because yes, this is going to paint. But as for the driver's side, well, that's a different story completely, but we have answers. Here is a driver's side wing and there's no saving this one. It is completely crumpled. But the thing is with Porsches, the wing is also the headlight holder and the place where you fill the fuel up as well. Now I was so close to buying a second hand wing and I held off buying one from the dealer because I just thought it was gonna be way too expensive. But here I am yet again sitting next to a body panel which I bought from the main dealer and you won't believe the price. 383 pound. But check this. The cheapest second hand wing on eBay was £399.95p plus postage and it had damage. So it was a no brainer to buy one from the main dealer. So all I've got to do is switch off all the stuff off the old wing onto the new wing including the petrol filler cap and a few trims and clips. And the wing wouldn't be complete without the next part, the headlight. And we all know how headlights go on this channel. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But this is the state of the old one. So it definitely needed replacing. This time I've managed to match up the part numbers with the new one. So I can't see any reason why they wouldn't work because they're exactly the same part number. The only thing I've got to transfer is the Xenon on the back, the ball and a few little bits on the inside of the old headlight. And I'm not going to fit it into the wing just yet. I do want to see whether it works first. These headlights have no reason not to work. Come on. Headlights. Please. <laughs> They're working. Come on. That's working. Let me check the indicators. Uh. Oh, the indicators are in the bumper. Okay, we're good. <laughs> So they're all clear from the headlights, we can now begin to assemble the wing and put the headlight into it with peace of mind. And whilst I'm on the driver's side, I might as well finish it off with the brand new second hand side skirt. Settle down, quiet please, thank you. So what you can see on screen now is a Porsche Cayman S front end. This would be the most sensible and cheap option. But wait, hold it, hold it. What you can see on screen now is a Porsche Cayman GT4 front end, which is way cooler. Is that so? It is, it just looks a lot better. So let me guess, which one did you go for? Of course, I went for the GT4 front bumper. And it, this is sort of made out of a fiberglass plastic material. It's quite flimsy, but it's definitely going to transform the Cayman S. It's got loads of carbon all with it. So it's going to take a fair bit of building up. I'm going to build the bumper up and this is going to look so good. Of course, this wasn't needed to repair the car, but me being me, I like to upgrade things as well as replace them. And I can't help but think the GT4 and the GT4 RS look so much better than the Cayman. And I've got a small feeling this won't be the only upgrade we'll be doing to this car.
actually building the front bumper up took longer than I thought. There's loads of grills, trims, carbon, indicators, and the front splitter to go on. But again, this isn't gonna be a final fit because all of it has to come all off again for paint, as I've mentioned a hundred times before. So I just wanna see what the fitment looks like first and if we have to make any adjustments to the bumper before we make the move on painting it. Now remember the front lower crash bar was bent so we had to replace that but with the kit comes a new lower crash bar and it's actually a smaller one which is needed to fit the new GT4 front bumper. This is looking too good like the front bumper has transformed the car, I'm telling you. The indicators are working. The front bumper is on. We do have a few small fitment issues, but I'm only sort of testing it out just yet. I've not put in the uh, little fitment things for here, so that's not bolted up to the wing. Same with this side, so like the alignments are all off. We was trying to get the bonnet perfectly aligned with the bumper. I'm sure we can make that better than that, but it is so good look at the carbon on it that is going to look absolutely sick i did buy some side repeaters to go in here i put them in and i threw up they were 11 pound side repeaters so i'm gonna have to get some oem ones because the ones that i bought just protruded really far and they just look disgusting so i'm definitely gonna need some oem ones on screen now is a rear end of a gt4 rs and now on screen is a Cayman S. Can anybody tell me the differences? Big wing, big wing. Correct, Matthew. Anything else? Diffuser, diffuser. Well done. Anything else? Exhaust. Fantastic, Matthew. <laughs> so, as we've just learned, the GT4 RS has a spoiler, a diffuser, and a different exhaust. Along with the GT4 front bumper I bought, I also bought some GT4 RS rear end parts, including this huge swan neck spoiler. I wasn't 100% sure on how this was gonna look and I'm still not now, but either way, I'm committed to fitting it. We've already drew out the stencil on the boot and then we're gonna use some masking tape to stick onto the feet of the spoiler, sharpie some marks where the holes are, where the thread goes through on the bottom, remove the masking tape off the bottom of the feet, stick them onto the boot and then we'll know exactly where we need to drill. And hopefully we should have got it bang on because there's no turning back now. Once we drew for the top of the boot, we couldn't access it through the underneath, so we had to remove a few trims. Then we still couldn't access it, so we had to drill a few more holes in the bottom so we can slide up the bolt through there into the bottom of the spoiler. The man just dropped all the bolts. <laughs> he literally just dropped all the bolts. Wow. And yes, I managed to drop a few bolts into the actual boot, which was so annoying and hard to get back out. But once I got them back out, the spoiler was pretty much fitted. We just had to line it all up. Well, that is absolutely gigantic. And yes, it probably does. Well, <laughs> I know what you're going to be thinking. It looks completely out of place. And I kind of agree. But once it's all together, I think it's gonna work. It, a GC4 has the wing, this is all carbon, it's gonna look right. It just looks so dodgy at the minute with the wheels and the sort of positive offset and then it's, it's huge. Trust me, you're gonna have to bear with me on this one. Next up, GT4 carbon diffuser. And as we've seen in our little school lesson, the GT4 has twin pipes left on, left left and right so each side and the cayman s has two center pipes so for this we are going to have to get a new exhaust but just to test fit this i think i'm going to take off the exhaust tips for this to work one thing we're also going to have to do is modify where those two parking sensors go they used to fit into the old diffuser but now there's no room to fit it into the new carbon diffuser so perhaps those two parking sensors need to go into the back bumper Yes, that is looking sick. How much better is that looking? It's so much more aggressive and you get to keep the stock bumper as well 
<laughs> that, that wing is still still like, absolutely huge but we do have one more thing but we can't put them on just yet and that are these these are carbon side blades but these unfortunately which is kind of not that cool they uh stick on so because they stick on they're gonna have to be pulled back off again for paint so yeah i'm not gonna stick them on just yet but you get the sort of gist of it for now let's put another wheel on and let's show you the kind of well not the end result the close to end result well it's certainly one of a kind you're either going to be one of two people with this you're either going to be able to see the finished product and vision what it's going to look like when it's done or you think i've just progressively made it worse <laughs> the wing is looking crazy at the minute the carbon diffuser is looking mental and then the gt4 front bumper is definitely finishing this thing off but one question you're probably all asking right now is how much does it cost up to this stage right now let me take you through it so the pair of side skirts cost me 250 pound then the rear quarter glass cost me 99 pounds and the pot we didn't really need but i bought anyway the gt4 body kit 3706 pounds bringing the total build cost including the car now to 28,283 pounds and 33 pence so so far so good with the Porsche we're definitely moving in the right direction and it's looking a lot better from the moment we picked it up but I don't know if you guys have noticed throughout the video I've been wearing the new Porsche design t-shirt that we designed this is the Cayman S on the front as it was when we collected it with the Porsche design on the back these are so sick and there's only a limited number available of these and all the revenue made from these all go towards each build so if you guys want to show your support for the build you can do by grabbing one of these t-shirts with the link in the description if we do this there we go i should be able to take this brake line off with no mess maybe one of you could explain how exactly that works because i have no idea and today we're going to be replacing more broken parts and upgrading them at the same time like this broken flexi hose can I have these but better please now i'm replacing the old rubber lines for braided hoses which don't swell under braking and wear a lot better as well but I've been ignoring the fact that we've still got a lot more problems. There's no exhaust tips. There's still a lot of dents. There's half an interior and there's no seats. It seems we have some sort of suspension damage on the rear because this wheel is pointing in. And this wheel, the camber is, well, it's, it's going that way. <laughs> and best of all, we still have so many lights on the dashboard. <laughs> First things first, I want to get the interior in. And one thing that we needed to replace were the seat belts. These locked out during the accident because some of the airbags blown. So I sent my old seat belts off to the airbag team. They added new tensioners on there and changed the color of the belts to yellow. <laughs> Don't worry, this will all make sense in the future. But now the seat belts will work as usual because it has new tensioners on there. And with the belts installed, I can start putting together the rest of the interior. Most of the interior is held together with loads of trims and clips. And if I'm honest, I wasn't that impressed with the quality of them. It does honestly feel like a Volkswagen Polo. And for a Porsche, you probably expect a little more. This is sound deadening. And we need to cut a section of this off because this is gonna stick to the bottom side of the roof and it should stop that tinny sound. Much better. And it did. And with the sound deadening on, I could then apply the roof liner with all the trims and clips and the lights for that. And we should just be about there now. So these were the seats that came out the car. And as you may have noticed, we're gonna be getting rid of all the red in the car. And this side airbag on the seat has deployed as well. A new airbag for the seat is around 200 pound. Then we've got to look at getting the center of the seat colored. And in my opinion, I don't really like the stock seats in the 718. So I went and brought myself a whole new set of seats. These are the Cayman GTS seats, which are a little bit sportier, but in my opinion, 
a lot better. They have extra wings on the top there, like bucket seats. These don't. They've got Alcantara center. These don't. But they have the same rails. Electric adjust sort of backwards and forward, and everything else is manual, just like the stock seats. So in theory, these seats should just be plug and play. And there's only one way to find if that's true, and that's to fit them. And you're probably asking, Matt, you bought a GT4 body kit. Why not buy the GT4 bucket seats? This is why. Yep, I didn't fancy spending £12,000 on a set of second-hand GT4 seats. When the GTS seats cost me £1,100. Which I don't think was too bad at all. It certainly makes me happy. How much better do these seats look? It's starting to feel and look way more like a car now. I know it does look like a kid's toy at the minute with yellow seat belts, red armrests, and all the other mismatched colors in here, but we'll address that later on down the line. But there's more stuff we need to get on with. There is absolutely no reason why the Cayman should have that many warning lights on the dashboard. So we're about to plug it in and find out what exactly it's unhappy about. And also for some reason, I have absolutely no climate control. The screen is on, so they know there's power getting to it, but none of these buttons work. The heated seats don't work. These buttons work, but they don't. One is for an airbag. Well, there's supposed to be an airbag in the door. We haven't put that back in yet. Second one is for the instrument cluster. This is because we've got no TPMS sensors in the wheels. We've got temporary wheels on and there's no communication with that door. Again, no electrics in it. AC because there's no gas in the aircon. Front end electrics because we have no parking sensors hooked up yet. And rear end electrics because, well, there's no glass in the window. So do we still have an engine management line when we start the car? Hey! No engine management light, just the airbag light and the TPMS light. Next up, we're onto the suspension and we're gonna need the two post ramp for this. The left hand side of the car took a pretty big hit in the accident and definitely something is bent on the front and the rear of the car. Then we also need to address the exhaust later on in the video. I'm gonna be starting off at the rear of the car and just like most German cars, they're full of suspension arms. We have a rear arm which is used to adjust the toe in and out. We have a bottom arm which is used to adjust the camber and then a front arm which I'm not quite sure what that does. Like most of the crash damaged cars, I'm not really going to take a risk on this rear suspension. It's really hard to actually tell what part is damaged because it only has to be a few mil out. Just here you can see the nuts that are used to adjust the camber on each side. And you can definitely see on the left hand side it's been knocked way out. But instead of replacing arm by arm, I'm going to start removing the whole suspension leg. Once the suspension arms are connected, I can then remove the connector for the electronic handbrake. Then the drop link. And then remove the rest of the electrical plugs out of the way, like the brake wear sensor and the ABS sensor. I've got to take the caliper off and then the brake disc. And then finally, remove the wheel hub from the suspension strut. Not forgetting the drive shaft as well. And there it is, one wheel hub out the way with all the suspension arms on. I managed to pick up a second hand, or should I say brand new second hand wheel hub with all the arms on from eBay. That way I know now everything else is straight. And then it's just the case of doing everything that I've just done, but in reverse order. Remembering to preload the suspension before I tighten everything up. And moment of truth. Here we go. But I'm feeling confident. I think it actually looks pretty straight at the minute. Much better. We now have a rear wheel pointing in the right direction. In fact, it's probably pointing a little further out than it should but we can get all the towing done afterwards on the wheel alignment now we move over to the front before we get to the exciting stuff the exhaust so on the front which i think took most of the hit i can see quite clearly it's damaged the drop link but i'm not quite sure what else has again it's really hard to tell i also noticed that there's a little nick in the brake disc as well so i'm not going to take any risks on that 
First off, the under tray's got to come off. Then I can access the bolts for the lower front arm and remove it. Again, it's really difficult to tell whether this is bent or not. So I'm gonna carry on and remove the center arm. Now I couldn't find a full wheel hub replacement on eBay for this, so I had to go direct to Porsche for both of the lower arms and just hope that this fixes it and I don't need a new wheel hub. I've now got the main lower arm in place and I can remove the old drop link and replace it with a new one that I got from Porsche. Again, not badly priced. And once that's in, I can put the front arm in. Then I can preload the suspension all up, tighten the bolts, and then hopefully that sorted the camber issue out on the front. If I'm honest, I think we could be dealing with a bent wheel hub here. I don't think that's made any difference, but it might be too early to say. There's no damage up here to the actual strut tower, and this actually does have camber adjust, so you can actually move that in and out, and it's all the way in at the minute, as is the other side, but I just think it's still cambering the wrong way, so it's looking like it could be a new wheel hub. And I have found one here on eBay for 70 quid, so it's not too bad. <laughs> I guess that's what I get for just trying to get away with replacing two arms. Next up, I'm gonna remove the brake disc. And then I contacted Design 911 to see if there was any upgrades for the brakes whilst I was replacing them. And sure enough, there was. We've got these humongous brake discs now. I am not convinced that these are gonna work with the stock caliper. They're, they're absolutely massive. But apparently they do. These brake discs should be an OEM fitment and work with the OEM caliper and the brake pads, which seems crazy because they are so big. I'm also replacing the brake pads for EBC yellow stuff brake pads as well. So we're upgrading everything here. Then I've just got to see whether the stock caliper actually fits over the new brake disc. These are definitely not going to work with the stock calipers. I'm nowhere near where it should mount. It should be around there. I don't know whether you need spacers. It's, yep. <sighs> Well, that's a fail. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm so stupid. Inside the box, there is actually some bolts and you can see here little spaces to sort of space out the brake caliper. Well, I was wrong. You can see here how much longer the new bolts are. And with the anodized spacer to space out the caliper, I now have two operated brake discs and pads on the front of the car. I also changed the drop link on the driver's side as well, just to be sure. One thing that we said we was going to do in a previous video, but never got around to doing it, was giving this car a service. We have no idea how much oil is in this car because there's no dipstick and you have to warm the car up to temperature for the computer to read the oil level. So I've drained all the oil out and I'm also going to be changing the oil filter as well, which is in such an awkward position underneath the wheel arch. But I eventually managed to squeeze in and get the oil filter out. In goes a new oil filter, a new seal, and then they can pop it back onto the engine. Next up, the spark plugs, which are in an equally annoying place. There's only four on this engine being four cylinder, but they are each side of the engine. And you access it through each wheel arch. You can see the two coil packs here. There's a T30 just holding both of the coil packs in. Then a 14 mil spark plug socket will get them out. You can see the difference between an old spark plug and the new spark plug. It, they don't look actually too bad to be honest, but at least I've got peace of mind now that they've actually been changed. Service is done. There's no dipstick in this, so we have to start the car to make sure everything's okay, which is a little bit nerve wracking all the time after a service as well. Oh, she's good. Oil measurement. Unavailable. <laughs> I guess we just have to wait for it to warm up. Surely we are at the right temperature now. 100 degrees in the oil. Let's measure the oil. There, yes. Oh, oh we need a little top of a thing. Oh no. Yeah, we're, we're good, we're good, we're all green. Now we can move on to the fun part, the exhaust. So in the last video, me and Liam cut the tips off the exhaust system so we could fit the diffuser because the Cayman normally has center exit exhaust and the GT4 has an exhaust each side. Today, 
we're gonna rectify it and make it a little louder. I'm curious to hear what this sounds like because it is only a four cylinder, two and a half litre. So at the minute, no exhaust tips. We're gonna go Yeah, it's kind of like Subaru vibes. Is that it? Yeah, it's it, it's not the greatest of sounding cars. So the exhaust system on the Cayman is actually pretty simple. The turbo is here, the exhaust comes off there, the catalytic converter is there, it branches off down here, it then splits into two. It goes one branch off down there, which heads off through the wheel arch in there very strange and then into the back box there and it pretty much does a mirror image on the other side into the back box which usually should have some exhaust tips coming out here into the center but we need them to come out of here so if that's a two and a half liter turbo yeah. but you've got a gt4 kit yeah what exhaust do you bought i've actually bought a miltech exhaust for a 718k no you haven't i have because if I bought an exhaust for a GT4, the GT4 is a naturally aspirated it is. engine. It has different exits to what a Cayman S has. So I've had to buy an exhaust to fit a Cayman S, but we're gonna have to modify it because this is the usual exit point, which of course goes out the, the exit. The back. But we're gonna have to change this uh -huh. and we'll get onto that later on how we're gonna do it. How's it sound? How's it sound? Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> So what I've essentially bought from Miltech is a bat box delete kit. It's gonna replace the pipes that lead towards the bat box, but with no bat box or muffler in there if you're American. And I'm pretty sure as well, the Miltech exhaust is a little wider than the stock exhaust. So me and Liam are now getting off the standard exhaust and then we can start to line up the new Miltech one. And you can see exactly here, the difference between the Miltech and the stock exhaust. It's pretty much the same thing, but without the back box, as I said. Now I find it bizarre how the exhaust runs so close to the shock absorber, but I guess there's no other way it could route. The clearance is literally within millimeters of it. So we've got to get this spot on. Once we've got that pipe on, we can then connect another connecting pipe which leads towards where the back box would be. And this connects to the car with one of the weirdest exhaust clamps I've ever seen. So exhaust is on, there's not much of it. And this is the part where we're gonna have to make a few modifications. And um, the exhaust is, comes, well, the exhaust goes straight to here now. And the part that you get with Miltech is this. So this would go like that. And then you would have two exhaust tips like these, which are actually quite nice exhaust tips. They would go on like that and shoot out the back and that actually looks pretty cool. But we have no need for these exhaust tips and only, well, not really any need for these. This is the solution. So Design 911, I contacted them again and said, right, I need to convert my exhaust from a 718 Cayman S to um, a GT4. So they do this kit here, which goes on the stock exhaust. So this is for a stock exhaust, not a military. Sits sort of around like that. And then you get exhaust tips, which sit, yeah, like, oh, these could be quite far back, you know. So we've got to make something out of the Miltech and this thing from Design 911 to make this thing work with a new diffuser. Let's do it. Liam took the role as a fabricator, and I took the role as, well, just seeing whether it would work or not. And it only took us about half an hour to realize it's probably not gonna work. Well, it looks like we've failed with this. Um, we're just a bit too short, aren't we? Like, yeah, so that, and that's just the same size as that, so it's not working. But that doesn't mean we can't get a start up and hear what, because it wouldn't sound any different with the exhaust tips off or on, would it? It's not gonna make any so sound different. So it seems like we're gonna have to be like this until we can get an exhaust fabricated, unfortunately. I, I have no idea what this is gonna sound like. Let, let's just do it. Very, very turbo-y at the minute. 
We'll let it warm, we'll let it warm, and then we'll come back. Okay, at the minute, it doesn't sound like, it just sounds the same, but a little bit louder. Let's have a few revs. Way better than I expected. It's that, not bad for a that sounds sick. Yeah, that sounds sick, yeah, doesn't it? That sounds sick. What the hell? It needs a zero cell sports cap, though. I think. Yeah, I yeah, think it, it does need, need a zero cell sports cap. That sounds sick for like a a little a four, four cylinder. cylinder. Oh, Liam, that sounds loads That's better than yours. That's loads better than yours. Better than yours. <laughs> it's such a shame we couldn't get the exhaust tips on, though. do a shout out to tow bar express for fitting the tow bar on the range rover because we've used it so much more than we actually thought it's a removable a one as well so i'll put a link in the description for them for now let's strap the cayman and that is it ready so the cayman is now going to the body shop and you probably won't see it for about four or five weeks but when we see it next it hopefully will have no dents in it no scratches and it'll be a completely different color and then we get to rebuild it for reals the cheapest poor 718 Cayman S is back from the body shop and it looks so good. Well, almost so good. So the guys at Allied Automotive have just called me to say the Cayman S is ready. It's been painted. But they want me to check it over first because it's not quite complete yet. So we're gonna go and see what it looks like. Go. Oh my God, I can see it a mile away. <laughs> wow. That is uh, bright. <laughs> One yellow Cayman S. <laughs> yeah. That looks wicked. Oh, that is so good. With a new breathtaking colour, I got the Cayman S back onto the trailer and to the unit where we need to begin putting this thing back together. Wait, 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 one second before you rush to the comment section to tell me what a terrible mistake I've made by painting it this colour. Can we just appreciate the workmanship on this paint? It is, I can't believe it's the same car. The colour is called Porsche Signal Yellow and it looks different in all different types of lighting. If I just go up on the brightness of my camera, it starts to look more of a bright yellow. And then when we come back down to how it normally is in here, it's more of like a, orangey mustard color but the guys have done an amazing job all inside the doors all inside the door shows is absolutely immaculate there's not one imperfection on the paint even under here you would never tell that this car was silver before and not only that remember the dents in the driver's side door which we think were caused from a forklift well, they're no longer there. And the gap between the A-pillar and the roof, which Porsche wouldn't tell us how they feel, is now filled with Sikaflex, which I think looks as good, if not better, than OEM now. But quite clearly, we're still a long way from actually getting this car on the road, so we better get to it. I want to start from the rear and work my way forward. So it's bumper off and then it's on with all the trims that are supposed to hold the bumper on. Not forgetting the rear crash bar as well. Next up is the spoiler mechanism. Then I can move back onto the bumper. These are the sort of problems that I don't usually film, but I feel like you guys need to know everything. We've got a fog light wire in here and um, there, that's fine. We've got a parking sensor wire in there. Then it comes down here. Uh, it branches off to this, which is a parking sensor connector, which sits in the diffuser. Another parking sensor connector, which sits in the diffuser there. Up here, there's only two connectors and there for the registration plate lights. And then all we're left with over here is a parking sensor connector, which goes to that. And then this, which goes to the main loom, which then leaves us with no connector for the other parking, the other fog light. So the, there's none and then on the car, there's, there's none, there's only, there's only that. So I've got, I've got to be missing something. I, Unless it was never plugged in ever. This is possible. Maybe this is for, what is that fog light? So maybe yeah. the right hand drive and left hand drive ones are different. I am a pretty that's, clever guy. I reckon so that's a good possibility. It is, because some cars only have one yeah, fog light. Yeah, they only have one fog light. Yeah. So maybe it never had it. Hang on. 
There's three pins in there. Liam just found this, by the way. We were not yeah, going to take just... the glory from him. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then in there, there's, there's at, nothing. There's no pins in there at all. Okay, well, well done. Okay, well, for that, Liam, I think he needs a shout out for his Instagram at Chris <laughs> <laughs> That looks sick so far. It's looking way better with all the trims on. I would have put the spoiler on, but we can't put it on just yet because we can't get it to go down for some reason. We just think it's because all the electrics aren't plugged in yet. But one thing that I wanted to do whilst we have Chris at the unit is inside. So there's a few things on this interior which really do not match the yellow exterior. The ready brownie armrest the ready brownie like hood for the clocks and then there's also ready brownie uh, door cards as well but we are not so sure whether we're going to be able to take this off or not and if we can we're hoping we can color it so well let's give it a go now i'm going to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes trying to work out whether this red leather piece comes off and it's looking promising. Once we removed a lot of trims and I got the T30 on it, I can remove the clocks away from the dashboard. And whilst I was doing that, Chris was getting all the good angles. The good news is it comes off. Yeah! yeah. And now Chris has prepped the lever and he's gonna be using a special paint to recolor it. That is looking so much better. You would never know that they were red before. But the interior is the least of worries at the minute because we've got two completely bare doors that we need to build up. So, well, let's get to it. Normally, rebuilding something that you've previously taken apart is pretty easy. Apart from, I didn't take this apart, the body shop did. So this is more of a challenge than I first thought. But bit by bit, I'm working my way through it. I've got the window regulator already in there, and now I'm fitting the door locks and the door handle. Once I've fitted the door handle, I can secure it in with two torque screws the other side of the door. And then the door handle has to connect to the door lock. And this is done with a metal cable. It inserts into the door handle, and is inserted on the other side to the door lock. So when you pull the handle, it opens the door lock. If that all makes sense. After that, it's the wiring loom for the door. I've got to thread that through the door into the car and then connect it up to the fuse box. And once that's done, I can start connecting up all the wiring loom to all the places that it goes to. And the good thing about these modern cars is that the connectors only go to one place. After most of the wiring looms connected, I'll undo the clamps which clamp the window to the window regulator, then slot the window down the door, and then put back in the screws which hold the window to the regulator. And that should be everything inside the door covered. Then it's time for the cover and all the seals on the outside. And there's a lot of them. And that's not forgetting the wing mirror as well, which is only held in by one bolt. After that, there's the door card airbag, which actually deployed in the accident, so we've got a new one on here. And after I've tested the window to make sure it all works, that should be all good. One door out of the way, next up, it's the front wing, or a fender if you're in America. Inside the wing sits a washer bottle for all the washer fluid in the car. And after the washer bottle's in, I can slide the headlight in place. And now it's starting to look more like a car. Time to fit the side skirt, but not before fitting all the clips for it first. After the clips are put on, I can slide the side skirt into place, clipping the little air intake, and then on top of that goes this GT4 carbon air intake, which is part of the GT4 kit that I bought. Now this came with double-sided tape to stick to the side skirt, but we didn't trust it enough. So instead we used Tiger Seal, which we managed to get all over the paintwork. But after it had dried, it was pretty easy to wipe off. Then it's just the rear quarter window. We've just built up the GT4 front bumper, which I think is gonna make the biggest transformation of all. And let, let's lift it up, let's okay, get it. Liam, okay. you grab one side. Okay, let's see it, 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 let's see it. Three, two, one. Whoop! Oh! That's actually sick, isn't it? That actually looks sick. That's gangster, I like that. Yes. Oh, remember we got to well, we'll plug in first. We've got to plug in okay. indicators and stuff first. So we've got one here that goes there, and then one down there. If it works. It's weird how the front and 
the side indicator with the bumper. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we're working. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm flashing. We've got new Porsche indicators, not the aftermarket dodgy ones. New Alibaba's. <laughs> oh, do you reckon? Oh, oh this I'm looks. Seeing. I'm excited. I'm excited. Slam it. That looks so good. Yes. That is banging. And I'm right. That bumper is banging. <laughs> what a transformation so far this car's had. But it's still not fixed. And that is because on this front wheel, something is still bent, or this front hub. We've got some like positive camber going on. In the previous video, we replaced both of the lower arms, but still something is not right. And the only thing it could come down to now is the full wheel hub, which is all cast aluminium. And if something is slightly out on this, then it can push the whole front wheel out of line. And luckily, this wasn't too expensive. The front wheel hub cost me 62 pound and 95 P. Which brings the total cost of the build so far to 29,000 446 pounds and 28 P and that's including all the upgrade parts and we are missing a few things off the blackboard But we'll get to them and last time I checked the cheapest Cayman S is 38,990 pounds, so we're doing well so far But now we've still got work to do and we've got to completely dismantle this front wheel hub So we can replace it with the new one so it's off with the uprated front brakes the track rod end and some of the suspension arms as well. Then I should be able to take the wheel hub off from the damper. I really don't have much luck with this type of stuff. It seems they are different, but only very slightly. That This is the new one, this is the old one. This has got a really thin sort of outer diameter. This has got a really thick outer diameter. All the mountains are the same. We don't have this bit on this one, but... Uh, ah. So if you've got wing mirrors on your car, which more than likely you will have, and they're electric or any part of them are electric, more than likely they're going to be expensive. And on the Cayman S, there's no exception. I tried to contact a breaker's yard for a wing mirror and they wanted £700. But luckily, the parts on the driver's side wing mirror, if you remember, it was battered. There was loads of bits in the car and I contacted Porsche and just ordered all the little bits that I need, like the plastic surround, this little bottom bit, and that totaled up to just under 300 pounds, which I think we've got away with there. Another expense that we need to add to the blackboard. All of this stuff is slowly adding up, but I'm sure we're gonna get one hell of a car at the end of it. And now to pop on the final piece of the wing mirror, the glass. I had the wing mirror covers painted black to match the roof, which I think was a pretty cool idea. And then it's on with the door cards with the freshly painted leather that Chris just done for me, which in my opinion looks a lot better than the red. Nice and smart now. And then it's back on with the instrument cluster hood, which is also freshly painted. I cannot tell you how excited I am to get this thing finally on the road as I've never even driven a Porsche before. We managed to get the spoilers to go down after we plugged all the electronics in. So now I can finally fit it. And this is it. The big wing. The big moment. <laughs> this goes on. I think this is going to top it off. This is going to be the one. This is going to be absolutely sensational. Oh, this could be a two-man job though. Way it goes, isn't it? God. Oh, I remember this was so difficult. You're a brave man. You are a brave man. No hand in it. The worst thing is, if you drop a bolt in the boot, it's another like hour's work to get it out. No. No, 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 no. Yes. That's nice, that's nice, that's nice. Okay. What? Yes! <laughs> that is massive. <laughs> wow. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I know the wing is a is a 50-50 one, but the glass 
is next to go in. I think this is going to make it more look like a car. Chris with a camera work. <laughs> How are you even going to get that on? <laughs> oh, wow. Do you want a hand? Oh, oh. oh, my finger. Yeah, yeah, release it. <laughs> release. Cheers! Have you just fitted that? That's sensation. I think it needs window tints. Yeah. I know people are going to say get black wheels. I'm thinking... I'm thinking against black wheels and remember still we're missing the exhaust tips we need to get this exhaust done and fitted but there's still so much more to do i'm hoping today's the day that we finally get this thing on the road for good but there's still a few things that we we're missing one of them being the exhaust these are the exhaust tips yep these were the ones off the miltec exhaust and what we're about to do here, well, what you're about to do is uh, make these work. Make them work, yeah. Work your magic. Last one. Let's do it. Because I've fitted a GT4 body kit to the Porsche, the diffuser is now different, meaning the exhaust tips exit a different way. This is what it was like on the Cayman S, and this is what we're aiming for. So I've come to Jack's Fab, where Dave is going to use some of the best engineering skills to weld up one of the sexiest looking backbox delete pipes for the Cayman. How crazy does that look? This is now going to link the two exhaust pipes each side of the car into an X pipe. And little did I know how much of a difference this is going to make to the sound. Done. Look at that. That is way smarter now. Both of the Miltec exhaust tips are on. Matt would have filmed the X pipe area bit. And now. Well, I highly doubt it's going to make much difference to the sound, but it might. There's only one way to find out. Remember, this is a two and a half litre four cylinder engine. So it's not on paper. It's not going to sound nice, but that's not bad, not bad. Oh, that sounds different. That sounds well different. How is that? How is that sound? <laughs> that makes no sense at all. <laughs> that sounds sick. How is a bat box elite? Even though it well, it's basically an X pipe. An X pipe has made a massive difference in the sound of the car. One more rev, go. <laughs> It smashed it. It's absolutely smashed it. Legends, legends. Let's get it back on the trailer because we still need to fix a few more problems. Good news is the wheel hub, which hopefully is the right wheel hub this time, or in this case, left wheel hub this time, has arrived. And even better news than that, Chris. Yep. Bill Stein. The finest. Oh, I've got us some coilovers to go with the wheel hub. So we're going to eliminate all suspension damage now and make it lower. The stance is going to be better and we're going to have, have improved riding abilities. Nice. Bill Stein, Bill 16, B16 coilovers. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> If you've been keeping up to date with the build, you'd know we're still having some issues with the front left suspension. We've replaced all the lower arms, but something still doesn't seem right. So now we're eliminating all things that could be bent. Oh. <laughs> by replacing everything, including the wheel hub, the spring and shock absorber, and replacing it with these upgraded Bill Stein coilovers. Don't try this bit at home. That's what you get for doing mechanics in a car park. You dodgy guy. <laughs> <laughs> I've installed Bill Stein coilovers on pretty much most of my cars and it leaves me feeling like this. The coilovers are going to allow me to adjust the ride height and also adjust the rebound on the shock as well to get the perfect feeling ride. And hopefully the brand new second hand wheel hub is going to solve the other suspension issue we have on the front left. Once I've got that front corner on, I needed to take a trip out to a familiar place. Of course, I've come to Wheelmania for the 
God knows how many times this year to not only pick up the Porsche wheels, but also they have a little surprise slash secret that I know about that Liam doesn't know that I know. We are at Wheelmania's second branch, and this is where they offer the best wheel refurbishments in the UK. You don't have to look far to see the quality here. They don't paint the back pad of the wheels, and they also use these little ball bearings to put where the wheel bolts go in, so that area also doesn't get painted. So you never have any issues with them after paint. But we've not come here to get our wheels refurbished or have we so last time i was here if you've been watching the mark ii channel liam curved his wheels on the audi s3 that i bought him and that's not the first time he's curved his wheels that was like the second time or possibly third time and i brought his wheels here wheel mania refurbished them i even actually painted one of them and the guys have told me that he's actually been back already and told them not to tell me because we're exposing him right now. <laughs> Look at this. How can he not drive? Uh, driver of the year award goes to Liam Carey. So once again, Wheelmania are going to have to do a refurb on these wheels. Now it's time to see the Porsche alloys for the 718 came in and I roughly remember what I ordered. Wow, they look massive. <laughs> what? <laughs> look at these bad boys. These are Judd alloys. So I've tried to get them as close to the GT4 RS wheels as possible, but with a little extra and a little spice. These are 20 inch, the staggered fitment. We've got 265 uh, wide tyres on the rear and two 3.5 tyres on the front, obviously rear wheel drive. Gone for gunmetal grey. These are looking crazy. It's just gonna see what they look like when they get on the car. I could have picked from so many wheel designs and so many colours. There is that much choice here at Wheelmania. This is gonna be one of the longest coilover installs ever. But, oh, there it is. Oh, that was easy. There it is. It's just a big, about 21. 21. That should drop it down, but we've had to take the whole hub off both sides there. <coughs> Go on. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. With the alloys secured, I had to finish off fitting the coilovers. And as I mentioned, this was a pretty big job on the Porsche. We had to remove pretty much all the suspension legs and wheel hub just so we could get the strut out. But just like always, we pulled through and managed to do it. You can't tell me you've never started a job you thought was going to be five, ten minutes and ends up taking way longer than expected. And also the front left wheel is now looking in a fairly straight sort of line. So I think we've solved it there. I've never tinted a window ever before, but they say the best way to learn is to give it a go yourself. So I've got some window tint and I'm going to attempt to do the back window. First off, we're putting all the film over the back side of the window, cutting it to size, and then I'm going to use heat to shrink it. Right, I think that's down on the outside, but obviously tint goes on the inside of the glass. So I'm going to clean the inside of the glass and go from there, but stay down! The fingers, like, it does keep lifting out, I just can't. Come on. If we do this, definitely deserve to subscribe. Now with the tint cut down to size on the back, I'm gonna clean the inside of the window, get it nice and fresh, then me and Matt are gonna peel it off the back, take off the protective layer to then expose the sticky side of the tint and stick that to the inside of the window using water mixed with baby shampoo. And so far, so good. We need to be careful not to crease it though. <sighs> I creased it. I was so close first try, but we messed it up on the edges and I creased it. But it was going so well. So in three, two, one. Well, if I said I was happy with it, I'd be lying, but it's probably the best I'm gonna get today. 
From here, it actually doesn't look too bad. All the edges at the bottom were easy to get out because the water fell to the bottom. All the edges at the top to get out were really easy because when you lift the boot up, it all goes towards the top. But it was the sides that I struggled with and you could just see little bits of imperfections here and there is another one somewhere, I think. Yeah, just there. And But I think that's the best I'm gonna get for my second attempt. And I've still gotta do these side windows, so I check back with you. I am over the moon with that. It's like a 30% tint, so it's definitely not as dark as the back. That's a full limo one. Then it just fades quite nicely into the front. We are so close now to finally getting this Porsche on the road for the first time since I don't even know how long this has been off the road for. But before we go anywhere, I'm hoping now we should have no faults left on the dashboard. We've literally replaced everything. Here we go. And after reading the codes, unfortunately, it does seem like we have faults. And one of them, quite strangely, was for the airbag. More specifically, the passenger side seatbelt tensioner that we replaced. The other ones for aircon, which we haven't got gassed yet. The rear spoiler, which needs calibration, which will only happen when you drive it. And tire pressure monitoring, which should clear when we drive the car. But I went back and double checked all the connections for the seatbelt and they seemed okay. So it looks as if we still have an issue with the passenger side seatbelt, but I'm sure we can get that sorted. For now, let's see how this thing looks with the new wheels and I can finally get it out on the road. A good car. I, I'm absolutely over the moon with this. I can see why a lot of people like Porsches now. <laughs> so much like kind of response in the steering and it's really light on the front end that you can feel it all through the steering wheel. This is so <laughs> this is sick. The car is sick. How on earth did this end up turning to this? This has got to be one of the best looking cars I own now. Maybe even better than the Aston. The colour just pops so nicely, especially in the sort of autonic, autonomic, autonomic, autumnal, <laughs> autumnal <laughs> season. How wicked does that look? wheel fitment is perfect literally a 10 out of 10 fitment even the coilovers which we guessed and then on the back as well look at that it's like an oem fitment this car has come together so nicely and it's not finished quite yet i bet you're all wondering how much has it cost to get to this point right here back to the blackboard the windscreen the front windscreen is in shout out to screensaver and Eaton. But windscreens aren't free. 550 pounds. That was an expensive windscreen. Now remember, we could have done this a lot cheaper by putting the Cayman S back to standard, but we didn't. And it's even had a full color change, which was one of the most expensive parts of the full build. Bearing in mind all of the bodywork and everything that went with that color change was £9,500. Which brings the grand total of a full Cayman S build to 
45,791 pounds and 28p. Wow. <laughs> Quite obviously, I'd be mad if I was doing it for a massive profit, but still, 45 grand for a Porsche that looks like this and drives the way it does, I don't think that was so bad. Today is a big day because the Cayman S is going to Porsche, but if I took it to them as it is now, they'd be far from impressed. I haven't been able to enjoy it or even drive it because there's a few strange faults with it. And I'm hoping to fix all of these faults before we take it to Porsche. Now, so I'm gonna get a really bad roast in. Check this out, go on, put the wipers on to clear the lights and you've got absolutely nothing but you can hear the motor going through it. And we also have a wiper fault on the dashboard. And this is the exact reason why you don't put your wipers on when it's frosty outside because I think this is what's caused it. Right here I can see the wiper motor attached to the linkage and the motor engages using teeth. Now I put the wipers on when the screen was frosted and I can only assume I've snapped some of the teeth inside the motor. But I can only be 100% sure that that's the issue by taking it apart and having a look. Luckily on the Porsche it's not that hard to get to. There's three bolts holding in the linkage and one electrical connector on the wiper motor. And with the full mechanism off, I'm going to take a look inside. And to my surprise, the motor's actually plastic. I can only open it up this much, but I can see a few snap teeth in there. So it looks like I'm going to need a new one, which I've got. From a breaker's yard, I've managed to get a wiper, a, a wiper motor with all the linkage for 30 quid. I'm just hoping it's the right one because this is off a box stuff. It looks the same, but ish. Check the part number. Zero two one nine four one. Yep. Zero two two zero three five. Oh, it's close, Dad. But look, though, <laughs> look, though, look. It looks exactly the same. Yeah, just smash it oh, in. I think smash let's just it get in. it in. Get it in. Let's get it in. So the part numbers are different, but in this case, I don't think it's going to matter. They look exactly the same. Time for the test. Maybe it is going to work. Yes. Check it out. Oh yeah. Fixed! One, 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 one. <laughs> Please work. Oh, it's sensational stuff. One job fix, on to the next one. So the next fault is here. Engine control fault, consult dealer, driving permitted. And that is the engine management light here. To find out what's causing the light, I'm going to need the diagnostic tool. That into the OBD. I'm going to use the Autel to diagnose what's wrong with the car. Trouble codes. And hopefully it's not too sinister. The reason why that engine light on is oxygen sensor one heater control circuit. I believe oxygen sensor O2 sensor or lambda sensor or lambda sensor or however you say it. That is what's causing that. So we better get that changed now. To do so, we're going to need a ramp. And the M5's in one ramp, the Mercer Largo's in another ramp, and the Porsche's in a scissor lift, which isn't going to lift it high enough. There's definitely worse problems to have, though. So we have to do a massive shout-out to Mallory Performance for letting us use their ramp on such short notice. And we could get the Porsche in the air to inspect what's going on with this Lamba sensor. Now, you usually see two Lamba sensors on cars. One would be before the catalytic converter in the exhaust, and one would be after the catalytic converter. The exhaust gas is passed through these sensors and then they send a signal to the ECU to tell the car how well it's burning fuel. Then the ECU will be able to adjust the air fuel ratio to ensure we get the perfect burn. But with a faulty Lambda sensor, there's no way the car can find that out. Well, we've found the issue and this one's a cheap one because uh, we've just had a look. So this Lambda goes up here, there's a blue wire and it connects up to the connector up there. This one, we're just following the connector. It goes up over the exhaust down there. It comes up, ends up coming around here and look what we've just found. Oh, hello there. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's not even connected, but no, the connector this? is broken, isn't it? Yeah, you may as well put the new one on. So it's just, I bet the, the accident has just pulled the plug out. 
Okay, the plug under here is in and it's sealed up and it's nice. If that works, it works and it's saved. This Lamba sensor here was 120 pounds. So 120 quid, if that works, it's 120 quid saving just because it's unplugged. Good job, we'll find out. Clear codes. Hey! <laughs> it's looking good, no engine management lights. There's just one more light. And that is this airbag light on the dashboard here. And when we scan it with a diagnostic tool, we can see that this is caused by the passenger seatbelt tensioner. Sometimes when the airbag's blowing cars, the seatbelts lock out. But on this car, only the passenger side seatbelt locked out. But I already sent both seatbelts off to have the tensioners, uh, well, new tensioners put in, and also had the belt changed color as well on both sides, but yet still I'm getting a fault on this passenger side. Now I've messaged the company that installed the new tensioners to say I'm still getting a fault, but they say that can't be true because they've installed the new tensioners and everything was done right. It's got to be something to do with the wiring, but the only way for me to test that is to take the one out the left-hand side and put it in the right-hand side and see if the fault switches over between the seat belts so I guess we're gonna try that now the tensioners are installed in seat belts so when the airbags blow in the car it pulls the passenger or driver back into the seat to ensure the airbag does the job to its full potential your face doesn't want to be next to the airbag when that's blowing off now after this happens the seat belts normally remain locked out and the only way to fix that issue is to replace the tensioner or just replace the full seat belt which I thought I'd done this is the right seat belt this is the left seat belt there is literally no difference and the tensioner is this little section here the airbag plugs into that sends a signal down here which locks the seatbelt out in this mechanism and to be honest they do look like they've been replaced but that doesn't mean to say that it's faulty it could be faulty but you'd think the company would test it before they send it back but we're about to find out because i'm going to plug this in the left hand side and this one in the right hand side to see if we get a fault Driver belt tensioner below lower limit. Yeah. So they were wrong. It looks like there's a fault with the tensioner. I've got to send that one back, but it doesn't look like we're going to be able to send that back and get it back before tomorrow when we go to Porsche. So we're going to have an airbag light on at Porsche, but we can explain that it's, it's not our fault. And before you know it, we arrived at Porsche Solihull. I've come to Porsche to get the four wheel alignment done as I've had all the suspension off. And because we've had all the radiators off, I'm gonna need the aircon gas in as well. Here we go. <laughs> the only experience I've had with Porsche dealers is over the phone. So it's gonna be really interesting to find out what it's like at a main dealer. But so far, so good. But there was a weird tension in the air as I knew my car was about to be torn apart. Um, so today we've got the 7 when it came in, in. Um, we've got it for the um, outstanding recall on there, we've also got the visual health check, the air con gas and also the geometry check as well. Yeah. Um, and what I'll also do, I'll just go and grab the technician that's working on your car today. Um, okay. His name's Josh and I'm sure he'll look after you. If anything's free, then I'm there for it. And Porsche offer a free vehicle inspection. So it'd be wrong not to take advantage of that. Be nice to me. Yeah. <laughs> be nice as, to my car. As always. Yeah. I'm sure we absolutely What's fine. the outstanding recall? Um, so there is a recall on there just for the air intake grills um, on there. So yeah, yeah like just on the wing. Why is there a why is there a recall on that one? So the vents were slightly too big, which can allow leaves and debris to go in there. Right. So they modified the grills to slightly smaller than so Oh, I see. Yeah, right. Up there. A few papers left to sign, and then I could hand the Cayman S key over to the technician. Kind of a nerve-wracking moment for me to have someone from Porsche check over the car. Right, so this is it now. It's time to be absolutely roasted. <laughs> and now, the moment of truth. The Cayman S has been brought into the inspection area, but how good does it look in there? So this is actually pretty cool. This is like an inspection bay, which customers are allowed to go in and the technician as well. The cool thing about this is that I actually get to see and hear Josh tear apart the Porsche. Well, hopefully not, but we already know there's a few things that we couldn't quite do last night. Loads of 
the service lights on. Oh, okay. Also notice there's an airbag light on. Yes. That That's not my fault. <laughs> there's a non-genuine windscreen fitted. And that wasn't cheap either, still. It's like 500 and something pounds. We're only a couple seconds in and Josh is already tearing apart my car. But I guess they have to be really anal with so it. So is there an aftermarket exhaust fit to the vehicle? There well? is, yeah. It does, sound, it does sound very good. Yeah. It's quite loud. Start it up. Yeah. I've heard some that sound very loud, but I think that sounds well good. There we go. Approval from Porsche on one thing. <laughs> Everything checked on the interior. Now it's time for the exterior. I'm following the search around the front as well. Yeah. Which and actually look really nice. I mean, the pedal gaps don't look too bad, to be fair. They look okay. <laughs> we have got measurements that Porsche give us based on each car, which would be able to go around and measure. Oh, the okay. Okay, so they have like tolerances between each. Yes. Okay, yeah. that's cool. So we can measure those as well, but it's whether you want to scale that in depth a bit. <laughs> yeah. Panel gaps are looking okay. There's a bit of a bigger gap at the back of the roof there. Yeah. But I'm not going to lie, I did, I watched the videos on this car. <laughs> so I'm not, I have seen. You've seen that, yeah. that everything yeah. that's been. From when you brought the car to how it is that it looks. Very good. Oh, that, that's Just good news. Good. That's good news. But the roof, you guys wouldn't tell us what? how it was joined okay. here. So we've um, kind of gone with like a Sikaflex here to try and make it look OEM. Yeah, but yeah. Which you do it because you normally have that little channel that runs down at the edge. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the pillars come off. There is normally, if you look at the 718s, there is normally. Like a, a, a small a channel. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. So yeah. we've got it right yeah. to an extent. And I mean, that's always a telltale sign if it's been aligned properly because the fuel flap will catch. Oh, okay. So underneath, if the panel's not quite right, yeah. they tend to gap, but the gap on that looks okay. They are a little bit tighter around the bottom. Oh, it's just <laughs> no, close. All all so, far. so far, we're not doing so bad. So there was a few small things, as expected, that was picked out by Josh, including the missing toe eye cover. Now he's inspecting under the bonnet to check all the tyre inflators and the toolkit is complete that comes with the Porsche. And that's all looking good. Then he's going to check all the fluid levels. Now it's virtually impossible for Porsche to check every single component of my car to give it a full sign off as such. So this is far from that. But Josh can give it a pretty good inspection to make sure the car is safe for the road and will drive as it should. And right now he's checking all the brakes and the suspension. So yep, they're on 12 mil. So I'm guessing they're fairly new. Yeah, the fronts are definitely new. I can they're all the correct size and rating as well, which is good. Well done, Wheel Mania. Now the car goes in the air to inspect underneath it. All the safety. I do this in my workshop, definitely. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's what we like. <laughs> so, we can see there's a little bit of damage underneath the trays. Yeah. At least you've got the emergency release if you need it. <laughs> so that's, that's just right there. Where is that meant to go? That what I'm holding onto here looks like a brake cable off a bike. And if you pull it, it opens the bonnet. And you use that if the battery's flat and the button doesn't work. But I had absolutely no idea where that was supposed to go. That, so it's under the headlight on the right hand side. Right, I did not um, know where that was meant to go. But I mean, it's there. If the front fails, <laughs> at least that's a good place to... That's a full region, don't forget it for. Looks, you can see this support frame is bent as well yeah no remember that is so close to the yeah. gearbox sump now these support struts here yeah they strength from the bottom of the car right so because this is connected to these as well yeah if say if you if you needed to wheel along in it it may not oh go okay the line right because these are the strengthening plates for it ah i see so, so it's not if, just an under tray this one Right. Because if you ever remove these struts or this plate, it has to be wheel aligned again. Oh my god. <laughs> because there may be a slight bit of flex in the chassis. Yeah, yeah, and right. You have to wheel align it all again. I see. So I'm learning quite a lot already. And another thing that Josh pointed out is that there's a vacuum line which was connected to the old exhaust flaps when they open and close in different modes. Now, because I've now got a straight through pipe, I've just plugged the vacuum line with a bolt as I knew it would probably cause issues if I just left it hanging. But I didn't realise how big the issues could have been. So this is what the um, opens and closes the valves on the old exhaust when you're in sport mode, sport plus mode. So we've just plugged it. It's plugged as long as there's no leaks. Vacuum system should be right. I see. I didn't okay. realise it was that um, vital. Yeah, 
if that, that screw was to pop out, you'd probably call for a bit overheat. You'd notice a few no way. driving problems and Oh my like days. So we Apparently the vacuum system is somehow linked with the water pump. So if I didn't plug the vacuum line, it literally could have caused the car to overheat, which is so crazy. I've never heard anything like that before. So overall, um, let's say on a scale of, let's go on a scale of, one to ten, where would you okay put the car? I'll probably put it to about a seven. S not bad, not bad. From a Porsche standard, there could be a few things that could be tweaked to make it completely standard. But yeah, if that's not what you're going for, considering how the car was, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> it, it's come extreme. It's, it's come up extremely well. Well, that's not bad, and I'm sure we've got a few more episodes to get it to a 10. Now we've got to go get the wheel aligned and the aircon gas, so we'll see how that gets on. First thing Josh is going to do is a vacuum test on the aircon system to make sure there is no leaks. He runs this for around 20 minutes to be 100% sure. So whilst we waited for that to happen, me and Hannah had a mooch round the showroom to look at some dream spec Porsches. But Hannah seems to disagree. They look all the same. What? The just look at this. Okay, I know my facts. No, no, the minute details, that's it. That's what counts. It doesn't. That's the good thing about Porsche. It's not like a showy off brand. This is for gentlemen. You're like myself. Not a <laughs> <laughs> I admit, I was never a Porsche person before, but the more time I spend in mine and the more I see them, the more I love them. So we're skipping the four wheel alignment at the minute and we're going straight onto the aircon purely because that under tray, which isn't an under tray, it's part of the actual structure which just pointed out, which has a dent in it. When I replace that, it will throw the wheel alignment out again. So I'm going to have to order one of them, which was around £80 plus VAT, so not actually that bad. Then we're going to come back and get that four wheel aligned. But for now, time for Josh to do the aircon. So the aircon is now working, it held pressure, it's gassed. When we Tested it, it didn't work, so it needed the compressor to be running. Yeah. So we've run that in. It, that should be done every time it's really gassed, to be honest. Thanks. Wicked. So Good news for road trips, especially to hot countries. Hopefully the weather gets better. But other than that, we're all good. Just need to get that wheel alignment done with the under tray. I've got to say, I was surprised at Porsche. Everyone was so down to earth and helpful. Sometimes someone like me walking into a main dealer, it can almost feel as like I'm not supposed to be there. But in this case, I almost felt at home. So thanks, Porsche. Well, I would say that's a successful trip. And thanks massively to Porsche Solly Hall. They didn't treat me too bad, if I do say so myself. My Porsche Cayman S was in such a bad accident. <laughs> Nearly every single body panel was damaged. But that meant it was cheap. Not one single person bidded on this car, but me. And since I've bought it, I've been rebuilding it panel by panel. Attempting repairs I've never done before. And after I rebuilt it, I then took it to Porsche, where it got inspected and almost got approval. One to ten, where would you okay, put the car? I'll probably put it to about seven. But they've asked me to come back for the second time because there's potentially something dangerous that they've missed out or I've missed out during the build. But before we head to Porsche, I stopped off at Mallory Performance because there's something we need to settle. Here's the thing, I've made the Porsche look like a GT4 slash GT4 RS. And a lot of people don't like that because they think you're making a car look like something it's not. But in standard form, the Cayman S makes 344 bhp and its big brother, the GT4, makes 414 bhp. So I think with a simple remap, we could see the Cayman S be faster than the GT4. And we're gonna be putting it to the test later in the video. Feels back. Yo! Standard, we're looking for the figure 344 bhps. 394 bhps. 44. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, 358 bhp. So it's actually running fast already. Like it's, it's this is a quick car. Oh. Here we go. Phil's gonna work his magic. 414 is the figure we're aiming for. 
see what we can get. So despite the Porsche already running 14 brake faster than it should, Phil is now tuning the car, finding ways to increase the power safely. And whilst he was doing that, I went and got some more cooling as the engine sits behind us. And if the engine starts to get too hot, then we start to lose power. And here we go for round two. Let's see what the power increase is. and two bhp and 510 newton meters more torque i think it's just getting a little bit hot we're so close to the gt4 bhp we've well and truly absolutely smashed it on the torque so it could be really really close a massive increase in power already but we really wanted that 414 bhp can we get it 400 409 bhp 505 newton meters faster than before i think it's illegal to be over 414 well there's only way to find out whether this cayman s is quicker than the gc4 and that's the race the gt4 let's find out <laughs> but before we do that i've headed back to porsche because we need to settle a few things and now we're back at porsche solihull because they've mentioned to me that i need to come back since our last visit to get something right but we've already been back once before let me explain last time we was here we took the porsche into the inspection bay where josh the technician fully checked over the car Gap and that looks okay. And although most of it was looking good, there was a few parts that I missed. You can see this support frame is bent as well. Now, because that support frame had some dents and it was also bent, it meant that Porsche were unable to four wheel align the car because that can affect the geometry of it. So that's why I came back the second time. But that second trip revealed even more damage. So here's the thing, we missed out that plate in the last video, we needed that plate. But last night, I tried to have a look and eyeball the track in myself because it was driving really bad, the steering wheel like that. And I have a small suspicion that my inner tie rod is bent on the near side. And if that's so, then we can't four wheel align it. So we're gonna get it checked out, <laughs> we're gonna get it checked out. If we just raise it up, we'll be able to check the, we'll be able to check the plate because we couldn't do that on, on the last one because it was on the, yeah. It was on the two post of ramp, it was flat, so now we can check for play. Yeah, oh, okay. Things like that. So the damage wasn't on this side, was it? No, it was, yeah. well, it's all round, but. Yeah. <laughs> so as Josh said, we're now able to check if there's any play in the suspension on each corner of the car. And we can also inspect that inner tie rod a little bit more to see whether that's bent. I can see it's bent from here, the inner tie rod, I can see it. Okay. Yeah. I'm not gonna what do you think? Wanna... Yeah, that's bent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can definitely see that this inner tie rod, yeah, that's bent. Brilliant. So we can't track it because we need an inner tie rod, but what we can do, put this rear support bar on. So at least we're going one step forward. And that's the exact reason why I replaced all the arms and suspension components on the GT3 out in Florida, as you never can be 100% sure on what's damaged. And it gets worse. There's evidence that I have a mouse in the unit. They, they like to go for the wiring as well. Because <sighs> something in the harnesses and the insulation that they're wrapped in that they just love. Yeah, that looks like he's tried to make himself a little bed. Yeah, he has, definitely. And just when I thought that was the last of it, we found even more damage. Alongside the support brace at the back, there's two arms which support the support brace. And there's an issue with them. So this is this arm, which we think has got fault lift damage. And well, as we've taken off, you can see it doesn't sit flat. Right? You can see here as well, the damage on each side of these is consistent. It's exactly the same. The chances of that happening in an accident is, well, really, really slim, but from a fault lift, not so much. If you remember when I first got the Porsche, we had damage on the left hand side of the car, which looked like fault lift marks. It was also along the back of the car and on the other side. And it seems like the damage didn't stop at the cosmetic side. It's also damaged the underneath of it. So all we can do now is put on the new support brace and then put back on the old broken support arms until we order some more and find out how much they're gonna cost as well. 
Right, new strut plate plate on but it's a bit of a consolation because uh, we do need these bars obviously so we're going to order them now find out how much they are as well as the inner tie rod and I guess we'll be back in the next clip I would say but the third time we come back was not only for a mistake that I made but also for a mistake that Porsche the brand made now it's time to find out the cost of the damage 115 quid each <laughs> For each side. <laughs> 115 pound each for those support bars. And I thought whilst I was there, I thought I might as well replace the under tray as it looked a little shabby as well. 211 pound 99p for that carpet bit of under tray. <laughs> we'll have to get it then. 813 pound with parts. With, this is including the four wheel alignment and that is yeah, I think that's put the build cost a little bit over than what we first thought. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show you the importance of sourcing and fitting parts yourself. But by doing these last final bits with the main dealer, I'm sure you'll never recognise that this car has ever been in an accident. Let's get the Porsche back to Porsche for the third time. It's round three, back at Porsche. We're back again for the third time. Hopefully this time we can smash it all out. Ah, oh, the brand spanker. <laughs> so all that's left to replace now are these two arms here and here, squashed by forklift. The massive under tray here, which we've just got, which was seriously expensive. And finally, the inner tie rod. But there is one more thing, which is why we've been recalled back here as well. But let's get Josh on this first, and then we'll check back with you afterwards. Hopefully we can get this four wheel aligned after as well. These are the parts that need replacing, and Josh was on it. First off were the two rear support braces, which were easy enough to change, and then the rear under tray. Then we're moving on to the front bent tie rod, which Josh removed now. And here are all the old broken parts. Oh yeah, that's definitely bent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see it straight on camera that that is well and truly bent. Now, do you guys remember when I was fitting the roof of the Porsche? We weren't quite sure on the correct repair procedure when fitting the roof. And when I called Porsche, they wasn't allowed to tell us it. It is a structural repair, so unfortunately they wouldn't be able to give you any information on it. Oh, bugger, right. And weirdly enough, the same goes for this inner tie rod because it's actually classed as a repair. We're not allowed to show you the repair because they're not allowed to show you repair procedures or maybe they're just worried that one of you guys will tell them that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> After the super top secret repair was done, the Cayman got brought into the alignment bay, where it has these type of lasers which are attached to the wheel hub. And this is going to allow Josh to get the wheels all pointing in a straight line. And with a few adjustments, Josh has got the car pointing straight. Obviously, the camber is different to factory spec because we've got different to factory spec suspension on. <laughs> so it's, it's lower. But we should be ready just about to test it on the track tomorrow. But there is one thing that we also got called here for, which we're not actually gonna be able to do. And this is my fault, isn't it? Uh, it's the air intakes at the side. So we fit new air intakes on the side, but have these been replaced? This has been replaced, but that is additional. Have the, has the other side been replaced as well? Yeah. The skirt? Yeah. So they've already got the modified inserts in anyway. Well, there we go. And the reason was that, if I'm right in saying, was it leaves getting caught yeah. up? So you can, I don't know if you can see it just in there, where that grill is. Yeah. There's a grill just inside. And Porsche deemed that the gaps were slightly too big and it was allowing leaves, etc., in, into the airbox. So they recalled them to clean the airbox out and then to put smaller uh, yeah. vents in. Did someone, did someone set on fire? 
I'm not sure. <laughs> and he's probably not allowed to say. <laughs> I don't think so. I think Porsche caused it just in time. <laughs> yeah, of course it did. <laughs> well, actually, the more sinister story to the recall is that the air intakes are being changed to prevent cigarettes entering the engine. Because apparently, and I don't know how true it is, someone out there in the world threw a cigarette, it entered into that air intake grill, and it set fire to either leaves or the paper air filter. And that just goes to show you that no one's perfect. Even the big manufacturers miss little things when building these cars. But my car is ready in a straight line, ready for the track tomorrow. Let's see if the Cayman S can beat a GT4. Here we are at Kerbera Sprint Course, a tight, <laughs> twisting, technical track, perfect for the 18 and a half at thousand pound Cayman S. But what I really want to know is, is it faster than a 90,000 pound GT4? The Cayman S with 409 bhp, 506 newton meters of torque, and a four-cylinder engine. And the GT4 with 414 bhp, 420 newton meters of torque, and a six cylinder engine. The Cayman S was 18 and a half thousand pounds, and the GT4, 90,000 pounds. But will money buy you speed? One fast lap and one drag race will decide. I'm in the Cayman S, but we have Ben, a professional driver in the GT4. Let's see how this pans out. It's one hot lap, the underdog is me. Let's do this. You ready? Three, two, one, go! The Cayman started off so well. We're a bit sideways. Oh my God, the traction is completely off it. Well, I gave it my all. <laughs> it's absolutely stinked. <laughs> well, let's see how the GT4 gets on. Three, two, one, go! The GT4 looks so quick with Ben behind the wheel, skipping around each corner. But would it be enough? Was <laughs> that was it fast, Matt? Was that one fast? Time for the results. Matt's time. Yeah. 30.41. Good. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Ben's time. 30. Really? Point four two. You're joking, there it you go. that close. So, so I think Ben needs to go in both cars because at the moment the Cayman is faster. <laughs> that sounded nuts. <laughs> Come on, Cayman! Second faster no, it than ain't. the GT4. No. Is it actually? 29.97 on the lap. <laughs> oh my, and his first lap as well. It seems there was only one way to settle this, and that's with a good old fashioned drag race. Cayman S versus GT4. Oh my God, here we go. Come on, Cayman. Winner takes all on this one. The Cayman took the win on the first race, so he raced again, and again. But the results were the same each time, with the Cayman winning. I've left it! Come on, the Cayman S! How have we done this? What a car! It's beat it on the track and on a drag race. People are gonna think we're making this up. So sometimes building something is better than buying something but let me know which one you would choose thanks so much for watching this video if you've enjoyed it hit that subscribe button hit that thumbs up button and i'll see you in the next video peace out bhp fast bhp fast <laughs> we're going to be getting a letter now from porsche if it goes yeah. over 414. Yeah.
Drop that 